Hollywood, California, Monday, April 5th. <laughs> the Lux Radio Theater presents Clark Gable, Josephine Hutchinson, Adolf Manjou, and Jack LaRue in the Farewell to Arms. Presents Hollywood. Our players, Metro Golden Mayor's renowned star, Clark Gable, and Josephine Hutchinson, Adolph Manju, and Jack LaRue. Our guests, the eminent director of A Farewell to Arms and many other hit pictures, Frank Borsegi, and Courtney Riley Cooper, famous writer and criminologist. Our producer, Cecil B. DeMille. Our conductor, Louis Silvers. Before raising our curtain, we acknowledge with gratitude the award of the Women's National Radio Committee, who, as representatives of 15 million club women, have just named this program first on the air in the field of dramatics. And now, from our stage on Hollywood Boulevard, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap greet you and extend a cordial welcome to the Lux Radio Theater. Lovely Jean Parker tells you this. Try a Lux Toilet Soap Beauty Bath next time you have a date to keep. It protects daintiness, makes you feel sure of yourself. May we add just this to Miss Parker's statement. Yet Lux Toilet Soap itself costs so little that any girl can buy it. And now, our producer. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Twenty years ago tonight in Washington, a group of weary statesmen left the council chambers of the nation, knowing that when they returned, they must seal a declaration no longer avoidable. On the following day, April 6th, 1917, word went round the world that the United States had entered the war. There were those who had not waited. Among them, 19-year-old Ernest Hemingway, who had joined the Italian army. He emerged at the struggle's end with four possessions. On his chest, two medals for valor. In his shoulder, a silver plate, replacing what steel had carried away. In his mind, a story that cried out to be written. Basing the tale largely on what his war-weary eyes had seen, he labeled it a farewell to arms. The world accepted it as one of the most graphic, true, and tender accounts of the conflict. Lawrence Stallings adapted it for the stage, and it came to still greater glory on the screen. For many months, we've aspired to bring a farewell to arms to the audience of the Lux Radio Theater, but patiently waited until we could announce the stars whom we present tonight. Clark Gable as Lieutenant Henry, Josephine Hutchinson as Catherine Barclay, Adolf Manjou as Rinaldi, the same role he played in the picture, and Jack LaRue as Father Romano, the party created for both play and screen. In his story, I don't think it was Mr. Hemingway's intent, nor is it ours, to point a finger at how the war began, nor how it ended. After 20 years, we've forgotten a lot. Perhaps it's just as well. But tonight, at least, let us remember brave men and lost lovers, as we dedicate this tale to those ordinary human beings caught in war's relentless circumstances. And now... The Lux Radio Theater presents Clark Gable, Josephine Hutchinson, Adolphe Manjou, and Jack LaRue in A Farewell to Arms. front, a pitted road, twisting down toward a plane. Three ambulances, freighted with wounded, growl unsteadily forward. Frederick Henry, in the uniform of an Italian lieutenant, his steel helmet half down over his face, dozes beside Bonelli, the driver of the last ambulance. Accidente, you hungry guns. You still grow. Get off my lap, you're drunk. Tenente Frederico, wake up! 
Buy me a dark one. I don't want blondes. I like brunettes. Please, please, Tenente Frederico, wake up. What's that? Oh, oh, Benelli. Are we at the hospital yet? No, Tenente, but you were sleeping and you talked. Oh, did I? Well, what did I say? What did you... <laughs> you Americanos find pleasure no matter where you are. You haven't been dreaming about the girls again. Oh, then I show good sense even in my sleep. What else is it to dream about? Think war all the time, Benelli, and you'll blow out your brains. Ah, those are men in the back. Why do they not keep a quiet? I know what he wants. What is the matter with you back of that? I'm getting you to the hospital as fast as I can. I can't stop. Not to hear. The brakes won't hold. Poor devil, he's dying. He's well off, but he doesn't know it. Ah, uh, see, Tenente. Don't hang on to those brakes. Throw your engine wide open. If we crash, it won't make matters much worse. What, Tenente? Drive faster. We can get down there in no time. Then you can help a man meet death. You have order, Tenente. Well, what'd you stop for? We have run off the road, Tenente. Get back there and see if you can help that fellow. See, si, Tenente. Hey, you. You over there with the fence. Ah, uh, see. Si. Which way is Garizia? Oh, back one mile. He turned to the left. What's the matter with you? Sick? Oh, see. Si. Where's your regiment? Up there where you come from. Into the line again. In what way are you sick? Oh, I, I hurt my leg tonight. Oh, yeah? Oh, it is true. It, it trained me to walk. Yes, if you're walking toward the trenches. But if you were walking away from them, you could walk all right, couldn't you? Oh, please, Tenant. Be merciful. Take me back to the hospital. I can't go up there again. Oh, Mother Mary, I can't. I don't blame you. It's tough luck, soldier, but there's nothing I can do for you. I won't go. No, no, I won't. None of they shoot me. Keep away from the Tenente. Oh, no, he's all right. He's a crazy. The Tenente can shoot him if he wants to. No, I don't want to. I know how he feels. Tenente, oh, please help me. Well, there's only one way I can help you. Benelli, huh? the man who was dying, how is he? Dead. He's lucky. All right, soldier, turn around. Turn. Uh, head up. Oh, see, Tenente. Now. Tenente, you club him on the skull with your revolver. Look, he's a-bleeding. Sure, we can take him back this way. Get rid of your dead man, put this one in his place. Tenente, that is why you hit it. War's a rotten business, Benelli. Come on, put him in the back. Let the Red Cross look good, see? Ah, just about perfect. Come on. <laughs> there will be pretty nurses here, Tenente. Brunettes? Ah, they are always brunettes. Yeah, I'll believe that when I see them. Hey, Orly. Yes, Lieutenant? We have wounded out there. But we are English, Lieutenant. I'll inform the Italian unit. It's in the other wing. Well, thanks. Hey, Benelli. Hmm? Look at that girl going down the hall. See her? But she's a not brunette. Oh, she's darn pretty, though. What the devil is she crying about? I go see about the men, Tenente. Yeah, okay. Oh, nurse. Nurse. Hey, tell me something, will you? What's the matter with that girl going down the hall crying? Well, if you must know, they're sending her back home. Home? Well, people don't generally cry when they're sent home, do they? Would I'm you not. cry? If I were in her place. She was married just a few days ago, and they found out about it, and they discharged her. Oh, that's different. All war is different, isn't it? Things happen that never could happen except in war. Right. She's worked like a slave, day after day giving every ounce of her strength. She won't go to hell for finding a few minutes of happiness. Why couldn't they let her stay for a while? Regulations. Precisely. She married him, so she has to leave him now. Go back to England and leave him here to die by himself. Without comfort, without... Nurse? That no home, please? Yes, Miss Smith. Wait a minute. Who are you? <laughs> that doesn't matter much when a girl's heart is breaking. Does it? It matters to me. First of all, you're brunette. What's more important, though, you're real. Nurse! I'm coming. I'll see you again. Will you? Nurse! What is it, Miss Smith? Hey, baby! Ronaldi! <laughs> you old sobo. I am very happy to see you. Finally you turn up, eh? Hey, listen, Ronaldi. Who is that nurse just turning into that ward? <laughs> you still recognize the beauty. Who huh? is she? Miss Catherine Barclay. I like her myself. Did you bring me some good cases, baby? She's a regular. What are you under fire? I have worried about you. Barkley. That sounds English. Seven operations today, baby, and one of them was beautiful. 
I took the heart out. A nurse, but still human. The heart lay in my hand. It was lovely. Soon, Rinaldi would be the best surgeon in all the corps. Then in all the army. Someday in all of Italy. What's that? The best surgeon in all Italy. Well, why not in all the world? Uh, why not? <laughs> you haven't changed, have you? Nothing changes in these days except the front-line trenches. You will like it here, baby. I've started to like it already. Miss uh, Catherine Barclay. She's yeah? gorgeous. The English nurses are always gorgeous, but she is more beautiful than any of them. I am in love with her. Oh, does she know it? Uh, not yet. Uh, have you any money? What? Oh, uh, a little. Well, it will be enough. Uh, lend me 50 lire. What for? Well, I must make on Miss Barclay the impression of a man of sufficient wealth. Now, wait a minute. But I must convince her that the great Rinaldi, who will one day become the greatest surgeon in the world, is even greater than he really is. You are my good friend and financial protector. <laughs> well, only you're crazy. Well, but you lend me the lire. Oh, Lord, what else can I do? Uh, the last detail is perfect. Now we can eat and drink, and then I have an idea. Tonight at the mess. I won't be at the mess. But you will when I tell you. A special occasion. Song, wine, a beautiful girl. I will see that you... Hey! Hey, it's an air raid. They bomb us. Watch out for yourself. I'm going my vision. Steady, everyone. Steady. The Barkley. The Barkley. Where are you? They bomb us. They bomb us. May their soul sweat in blood. Buonasera, Father Romano. You come to the mess hall tonight? Yes, Rinaldi. Look at that soldier. That's so close. Yet he sings. <laughs> he has no idea how close he is to death because of his singing. <laughs> it is well you can laugh, Rinaldi. Well, if we fail to laugh, poof, we go mad. Ah, here comes the baby. Hello, Father Romano. Oh, Frederico, you're back safe. I am glad. I'm not sorry. Father Romano prayed for you while you were away, Frederico. Every time you go up, he does the same. Oh, I pray for you all. And behold, here you are. Come, Frederico. I promised you something this evening. They are outside. Oh, suppose we stay in here. I'm tired. Father, are there any reports on who was killed by the bombs? And the good father was with us. No lives lost? Not one. Was wounded. A few. Was, was one of them a nurse? No, Frederico. So you see, baby, there is no need to be so sad. Besides, we are going outside. All right. I'll see you later, Father. I will be here, my son. Frederico, look. Over there by the door. Sparkly. And Miss Ferguson, Frederico. They are waiting for us. Come. Hey, Rinaldi, what's the idea? Well, you gave me 50 years. We have won a big time, eh? Good evening, Miss Barclay. Good evening, Doctor. How are you, Lieutenant? I'm glad to find you're safe. And, Frederico, this is Miss Ferguson. How do you do? How do you do, Miss Ferguson? That uh, tenor is off on another excursion. Let us all go in the garden. <laughs> you're not fond of tenors, Dr. Rinaldi. There are tenors and tenors. Uh, like I say... Hey, where is Ferguson? Well, I thought she came with us. I see you two don't know, Fergie. You mean she stayed inside? There are such things as orders. The devil take orders. Three of us cannot go wandering about here in the garden. Orders or no orders. Frederico, you go find that nice Miss Ferguson. What? She's your guest, not mine. What? But, Dr. Rinaldi, you did invite her. Very well. I will get her, but I come back. She must not disappoint Frederico. <laughs> So you're the one Ferguson mustn't disappoint. That's how Rinaldi planned it. You want it that way? No. <gasps> well, then I'm glad Fergie walked out. And I'm glad you helped send Rinaldi after her. Did I? I'd like to think of it that way. I'm afraid it's a fact. It wasn't very kind of me. It was perfect. <laughs> oh, I refuse to argue with you. It'd spoil everything. Oh, it's a wonderful night. You helped to make it even more wonderful. You know how to use words. And we do seem fated to meet one another, don't we? Yes. Thank my lucky star. Oh, but Rinaldi will come back and bring Ferguson with him. Suppose they don't find it. Great. Babes lost in the woods. Yes. Babes who don't want to be found. See, that's an idea. We walk off into the darkness. And hope we find light. You ready to start? Yes. I may be an idiot, but I'm ready. <laughs> Lo 
late. Don't you think we ought to get back now? Why? No one will find us here. You seem to have found this place without difficulty. <clears throat> well, I, uh, I, I was guided. Uh, you know, I've never been here before, honestly. <laughs> I want to believe you. I want to believe all the things you've been saying to me. I meant every word. Somehow, I'm not sure I know exactly what it is, but you're not like the others. What do you mean? Well, just having you near me. People who don't know war would call it foolish, I suppose. But war does make a difference. It makes things happen, Pastor. You do understand. There isn't time to delay when lives hang in the balance. No time for delay. That's it. You're an American, aren't you? Yes. What are you doing in the Italian army? No, it's not really the army. It's only the ambulance corps. But why did you do it? I don't know. Why did you? I think to forget. But it hasn't worked out as I hoped it might. I, I don't seem to forget. Can you tell me what? I've never told anyone. What is it you haven't been able to forget? The man I was to marry. Oh, oh well, where is he now? Dead. I'm sorry. He was killed in the sun. We, we grew up together. And why didn't you marry? I didn't know then what war was like. If I had it to do over again, I... You would have married him. Yes. When I joined up, I remember I had the silly idea that he might come to the hospital where I was. With a saber cut, I suppose, and a bandage on his head. Something picturesque. This is the picturesque front, not France. He didn't have a saber cut. They blew him to pieces. What are you thinking about? You. I'm glad, Frederick. No one could be close to you like this with, without feeling the wonder of it. It doesn't seem as if war was within a hundred years of us. It isn't. It doesn't seem to be any yesterday. No tomorrow. Nothing but just this one moment. And that's all that counts. Catherine. Please, don't. But I'd like to. No, please. But I want to kiss you. Thanks. I didn't mean to slap you like that. I'm sorry. I, I just couldn't stand the nurse's evening off aspect of it. Did I hurt you? I think you rather helped me. I'm ashamed of myself. But you are beautiful. And I'm mad about you. Tomorrow morning I go up to the front. If a shell got me and you never saw me again. No. Don't say it. Why not? Because... I love you, too. Then? I love you, Frederick. While we are waiting for Clark Gable, Josephine Hutchinson, and Adolf Manju to go on with the next episode of A Farewell to Arms, let us take you with us for just a moment down Hollywood Boulevard a few blocks to Grauman's famous Chinese theater. The line is forming already to see Lloyd's of London. Let's listen in on Dot, who planned to meet Margie before the show. Gee, Margie, you must have been here ages to be so near the beginning of the line. Guess who I saw way back near the end? I don't know. Who? Evelyn with Jack. No! Mm -hmm. Doesn't that beat all? Oh. I mean, he kind of stopped seeing her, you know. Yeah? Well, Evelyn's got on a pink dress tonight, and she looks wonderful. Listen, I'll tell you a secret about Evelyn. You know, ever since she got that job as an extra at RKO, she's been paying some attention to her complexion. They have Lux toilet soap in all those dressing rooms. And she took the hint. Well, it certainly worked. Honest, her skin looks grand. Going great guns with Jack, too. Looked like a real romance. A real romance. Any girl whose complexion is lovely can expect one. Here's where Lux toilet soap comes in. Its active lather thoroughly removes dust, dirt, stale cosmetics. Guards against unattractive cosmetic skin. Use gentle Lux toilet soap before each application of fresh makeup, before going to bed at night. Remember, nine out of ten lovely screen stars use Lux toilet soap. And now, Mr. DeMille. Back to our play, A Farewell to Arm, starring Clark Gable, Josephine Hutchinson, and Adolf Manjou. <laughs> it's early the following morning. In a corridor of the hospital, Rinaldi, dressed for the operating room, walks quickly toward an open door. As he's about to enter, 
Frederick bars his way. Benali. Baby, why did you return? I forgot something. One hour ago, I, I, I wished you got speed from my window, and here you are back again. Where's Catherine? Catherine, I see now. You were making progress while I was hunting for that stupid Ferguson. Well, I drove off without saying a word to Catherine. I can't go that way. I don't want to. Where is she? She's on duty. I'll find her. Such things are not permitted. Oh, come now, baby. You know that. Well, I'm going up to the front, Benali. I may come back and I may not. They may cart me into you so you can take my heart out, hold it in your hand, and tell someone how beautiful it was. Do not talk like a fool. Oh, we don't know what will happen. I'm going to... Oh, there she is. Catherine. <laughs> Catherine. Frederick, what's wrong? Miss Barclay dropped the tray with the patient's breakfast on it. That is all that is wrong at the moment. Catherine, you're all right, aren't you? But yes, I'm all right. Well, I... I came to, uh, I thought that, uh, uh, well, you see, I'm going to be away for a while, and well, I didn't want you to think that, that I'd just gone away. No. What I mean is that, uh, well, I'd hate to have you think it, uh, that, that it wasn't important to me about us. Uh, I don't exactly know how to say it. You said it very nicely, dear. Thank you. Will you be gone long? Only a few days. There's going to be an offensive up above the Piave. Nothing much, I guess. An offensive? Oh, you'll be careful, won't you? I won't get hit. But you ought to have something to protect you. I'd like you to have something of mine. Here. Here, take this, Frederick. Your locket? It's a St. Anthony. They say a St. Anthony will guard you from harm. I'll take care of him for you. Take care of yourself, Frederick. Darling, I... Not here. Goodbye, dear. I'll be waiting for you. Goodbye. Baby, you are a fool. So long, Rinaldi. If my heart must be cut out, I hope you'll do it. Get out, you wild devil. Stop worrying, Benelli. But they lay down the barrage. It isn't going to harm us any. I have St. Anthony with me. Her St. Anthony, Benelli. I won't get hit. Please come into the dugout. You are driving me crazy. Please, for her sake. All right. All right. Go in yourself first. Hey, it is getting a little nasty. Here, I dropped the tent flap. It blows out some of the sound. There. Hey, we better eat something. There won't be much time once the attack starts. Try this spaghetti, Tenente. Thanks. It does not taste so bad when you wash it down with some of the wine, eh? Drop that flap and come in, Piano. Something to eat, eh? Have they started to move up yet? Si, Tenente. Who's attacking? Belsaliari. Oh, what does it matter? Whoever goes, they never come back again. Have some wine. If no one would attack, the war would be over. But someone always attacks. It starts now. Hey, that was a big one. 420. Oh, you are a fool, Bonelli. And you never get anything right. It was 305. Sounded like a Skoda to me. Skoda? That's what I... They're finding the range. That one was close. They think we had better leave. And when we leave, <laughs> go well. Yeah, there's nothing can harm us. St. Anthony. Benelli. Benelli. Tenente. Are you safe? Benelli. They got me. There is a joke to go this way. And I just said, I won't get hit. Lieutenant Frederick Henry, lacerations of the scalp and possible fracture of the skull, multiple superficial wounds of the left and right thigh, left and right knee and right foot, profound wounds of right foot and knee, incurred in line of duty. How do you feel, baby? Who's that? You do not know me? Look. Oh, oh Rinaldi. What are you doing here? The major let me come. No one shall hurt you, baby. No butcher is going to touch my war, brother. Only Rinaldi can take you and not hurt you. You must forgive me for talking so much, baby. I am very unhappy to see you wounded. Did you take my heart out yet? Not yet. Maybe soon. Nurse, you fix those instruments? Yes, sir. How did it happen, baby? I will see that you are decorated for bravery. Perhaps we can get you the bronze medal. Did you carry someone on your back? If you did, I will get you the silver one. Oh, no, no, I didn't carry anyone. I couldn't move. But there was something heroic. Tell me what you did. I was blown up eating spaghetti. Well, it does not matter. I will get you the silver one anyway. Nurse, 
The ether. Shall I administer it? Yes. Now. Wait. Wait, Rinaldi. Where is Catherine? Don't worry, baby. I will fix you so you will be as good as new. You will see. Every day I learn to do things smoother, quicker. Catherine. I want Catherine. Breathe deeply. You will soon be asleep. No, I I tell you, Rinaldi, I want Catherine. I won't be able to get well unless I have her. I tell you. Do not try to sit up. Where do you think you will go from here? To the Italian hospital where they have male nurses with beards? Oh, no. I am your friend. Rinaldi, tell me where Catherine is. She has been transferred to Milano. Oh, then nothing matters to me. But it must matter, baby. You are going to get well. I have arranged it. You too go to Milano. Are you telling me the truth? Yes. Turn on your ether. I will be left here all alone with the war. Breathe deep, baby. No one to lend me money. And you there in Milano. Catherine. More ether. I'll, I'll be seeing you, Johnny. All right. We are ready. The scalpel. Well, my boy, how are you? Better, father. It was good of you to come. I heard they brought you in Milano. You like it here? Well, it's a lot quieter. Sit down, father. Oh, I cannot stay long, my son. They warned me not to tire you out. Oh, don't worry about me. Rinaldi said he'd pull me through, and he did. You seem tired yourself. I I am tired, but I have no right to be. You had the war discussion. Oh, no, my son, but I hate war. I don't enjoy it. You do not mind it. You do not see it. Oh, you, you must forgive me. I know you are wounded. Still, even wounded, you do not see it. I can tell. Come in. Hello, Catherine. Hello, darling. Good evening, Father. Miss Catherine, uh, you do not think I am tiring him? Oh, no. He's strong. He's got such a lovely temperature. It's always normal. I'm awfully proud of his temperature, Father. Yeah, maybe all our children will have fine temperatures, too. <laughs> our children will probably have beastly temperatures. Oh, my daughter. My son. Oh, don't mind us, Father. We're in love. Oh, I know. I could see it in your faces, but you spoke of children. Without war, you would live married in the grace of God. Is it not so? Why, yes. And you, my dear? Yes, Father. Then you shall be married. Now. Father. Father. Are you... Is that the marriage service? Of course you understand that army regulations prevent us from marrying. You can send Catherine home. Oh, but why shouldn't she go home? She'd be far better off. Shh. Poor cat. Our marriage, Frederick. It's a crazy marriage, darling. It's real. And at least I'm in white. No orange blossom? I can smell them. No organ music. I can hear it plainly. And do you, Frederico, take Catherine for your lawfully wedded wife? I do, Paula. And do you, Catherine, take Frederico for your lawfully wedded husband? I do. Then I, I pronounce you man and wife. And from my heart I can say, bless you in his name. Thank you, Father. In times such as these, man-made rules are not as important as the laws of the Father. Let me look at you, Catherine. I'm happy, Father. I see that in your eyes. Goodbye. I will come again next time I am in Milano. Give my regards to everyone, Father. I will. Goodbye, Father. God have mercy on you. Catherine. Married. You and I. Married. You love me? I adore you. I love you. So nothing else matters. There's nothing in the world can keep us apart now. Who the devil can that be? He can't be the father. Get behind the door. But if anyone found me... No one's going to find you. Come in. Well, Ferguson, welcome. You don't need to try any of your blandishments on me. Has Catherine been here? I wish she would come here. She's a fool when she's near you. Now, An absolute Fergie. featherbrain. The more she has to do with you, the less good will come of it. Fergie, 
And let me tell you one thing more. War or no war, let Catherine alone. If you don't, you'll have me to answer to. Now, I hope you sleep well with that on your mind. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Poor thing. Oh, she lived through it all right. You know, it's a lot of fun teasing her. Her nose does such weird tricks. <laughs> oh, good night, dear. Good night? No. But I've got to go back to quarters. Oh, just a little while. Please, sit close to me. Frederick. Yes. How many other girls have you loved? None. How many? Really? None. You're lying to me. Of course. It's all right. You just keep right on lying. That's what I want you to do. Were they very pretty? No one in the whole world but you is pretty. But what were they like? I don't know anything about it. And I don't care anything about it. You're just mine. That's true. Mine. Darling. And you never belong to anyone else. But I don't care if you have. I'm not afraid of them. But don't tell me about them. Ever. something, Signora? A ticket to Switzerland, please. Uh, but to where, Signora? What town? The nearest one to Italy. Ah, uh, that would be Brissago. Then that's the ticket I want. Catherine! Catherine Barclay! Fergie. Oh, Fergie, what on earth are you up to? I hoped you might come. Oh, you knew darn well I would after I found your letter. What do you mean by leaving instructions that no one was to tell that fool ambulance driver of yours that you'd run away? Well, he's, he's up at the front again, Fergie. That's yes. nothing new. He's been there for months. I didn't want to worry. Don't bother your head about that. <laughs> War doesn't make men worry about anything but themselves. Do you mind telling me what it's all about? I'm going away. So I gathered, but where? Why? I'm going to Switzerland so my baby can be born without guns all around him. You're... Catherine, your baby, our baby. Oh, I said that no good would come but of it. But Fergie, he's my husband. And now war hasn't even cheated us out of a baby. And you're going alone. Oh, I'm not afraid. Bringing a baby into the world isn't anything. Well, millions of other women have had babies. But he mustn't know. Yet. I'll write to him from Switzerland. He won't tell him yet. Promise. If the train leaves, Signora. You're running away. But I'm running away to happiness, Fergie. The greatest happiness I've ever known. Goodbye, Fergie. Catherine! Goodbye. For station identification, this is the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is KNX Los Angeles, the voice of Hollywood. Clark Gable, Josephine Hutchinson, Adolph Manjou, and Jack LaRue pause in our presentation of A Farewell to Arms, and we hear now from the man who directed the notable screen version, Mr. Frank Bozzaghi. Starting his theatrical career at 13 as a utility boy with a road company, he became a leading man in Hollywood prior to turning director 20 years ago. His succession of hit pictures began with humoresque and include Desire, Street Angel, Little Man What Now, the Academy Award winners Bad Girl and Seventh Heaven, and his current achievements, Green Light and History is Made at Night. Yachtsman, aviator, polo player, a friend to everyone. It's an honor to present one of Hollywood's greatest directors, Mr. Frank Bozzaghi. All of which finds me very grateful, C.B., and very embarrassed. Apparently, you've never seen me sail a boat, fly a plane, or fall from a pony. <laughs> but it does my heart good to be here listening to such a faithful and genuine production of a story that made my pet picture. Well, thank you, Frank. Our problem tonight, as every week, is to convey by sound alone what you and I do on the screen with a camera. And since we're talking shop, you and your pictures have a unique quality of sending an audience out of a theater crying with emotion, while sometimes the rest of us send them out crying with their money back. Uh, you do something to our 
innards that, that we can't quite equal. Just what is it? <laughs> now, you, now I'm on a spot. Well, let's put it this way. Some of us sell our stories by appealing to the sense of humor. Some buy magnificent, magnificent spectacles, meaning you, Mr. Mill. <laughs> Others buy sheer beauty and through clever psychological twists. I believe in trying to reach the heart. I think tenderness, simplicity, and little human touches are essential in making an audience live and believe what you have to tell them. That's what I strive for. Whether I succeed or not is another matter. Like monuments, your pictures prove you do. Tell us, Frank, did Mr. Hemingway work with you on a farewell to arms? No, but uh, we were fortunate enough to obtain a technical advisor, uh, a Lieutenant Charles B. Griffin, who knew him in Italy during the war. Lieutenant Griffin showed me a letter Hemingway had sent him shortly after he was wounded. The letter had been scrawled out from a stretcher and said, Have nine pieces of shrapnel in me. Not dangerous. Don't notify family. Everything molt the Benny. But with such stars you have here waiting tonight, it's time for me to get back to the audience. You've got a great show, CB, and a great product in Lux Toilet Soap. It's been a pleasure to be associated with both. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, and farewell. A Farewell to Arms continues, starring Clark Gable, Josephine Hutchinson, and Adolf Manjou. Months have crawled by since Catherine and trained for Switzerland. Months during which she's written daily letters to Frederick, but has received no answer. We find the American in his quarters near the front. In the garish light of a kerosene lamp, he sits at a crude table, writing. Rinaldi paces back and forth impatiently. Hurry, baby, hurry. It is time to go. Go where? What I told you before, the Villa Rosa. Ah, you will find things there to make you forget the war. New girls, all brunettes. Everybody is going. Not me. But, baby, you must. It will be a fine party. Besides, I said you would go. I can't. I want to finish this letter. To your frozen English girl in Milano who never answers? Every day, nothing but letters. You might as well be married. That's my business. Oh, baby, how you have come back to me. Serious, like a shopkeeper. And with a liver. Where is my war brother who used to be so gay with me? And go to the Villa Rosa every night. Oh, leave me alone, will you? Why, is she not uh, just a girl? Keep her out of this. So, a sacred subject. Believe me, baby, sacred subjects are not for soldiers. Be like me, all fire and smoke, but nothing inside. I said I wasn't going. Come on, baby. I said to leave me alone. You can call me your friend. Why in heaven's name can't you let a friend alone when he asks you to? Now clear out. So, I do not like that, baby. Then let me alone. I think that is a good idea. Next time you are wounded, I will take out your liver and put you in a good Italian liver and make you a man again. I will teach him a lesson. No woman can come between friends. Orderly. Signore Capitano. What is it that you have? The mail? Si, sí, signore. It just came. Let me see. Mm-hmm. Tenente Frederick Henry from Switzerland. So, hand me the stamp. Si, sí, Capitano. Return to sender. Rejected by censor. Send it back. Oh, Capitano. Uh... Send back all letters for Tenente Henry from that address. Sacred subjects are forbidden. Si, sí, Capitano. They give aid and comfort to the enemy. Stop staring at me. Send it back. Send it back. Sit down, brother. It's nice to see you again. Thank you, my boy. Oh, but you have changed so. You are not my Federico. Is there anything wrong? No word, father. From Catherine. Not a line. I've wrote every day to the letter to the hospital in Milan. She's never answered me. Oh, that's very strange. Something has happened to her. I know it. Have you tried? I've tried everything. I can't get any information at all. I've got to find her myself. I'm going to Milan. Oh, but my son leaves of absence are forbidden since the battle began. I'm going anyway. But that is desertion. I don't care. I'm going. But you will be caught. Oh, Federico, you must not do this. What does war mean to me anymore? What does anything mean but finding her? You remember that night in the hospital? I remember, my son. You married us that night, Father. But Federico, consider... I consider her only. Something has happened to her. Something serious. She needs me. I'm going to Milan and no one can stop me. Oh, may the kind Father protect you. When... When do you go? Now. The others are at dinner. 
By morning, when they miss me, I'll be halfway to Milan. And so, beloved, before very long, I will have wonderful news for you. God protect you and keep you. I do wish you would write. Come in. Oh, is there any mail, Rudolph? Best soup. Good, warm soup. My wife made it for you. Mm, that does smell good. There is no better soup maker in Switzerland, though I myself say so. Just put it here on the table. And bread. She made that too. The soup. It is right. It's delicious. Ah, there's more where it comes from. How long since you eat? Oh, I, uh, I haven't been hungry. Because your stomach says so or your purse. You have lost 20 pounds since you came to us. Well, I lose weight in winter. Ah, you do not lie well. Some things go badly, no? It isn't always easy. The heart can be so lonely. Yes. It is the way, Signora. My wife was the same way, singing with the happiness of a bird one moment. That's it. Black as a pit the next moment. Yes, and pits can be so black. But I won't have to wait very much longer. A day, two days, perhaps three. Then happiness. Yes. All the wonder of life for my very own. I'm a little bit frightened sometimes when I think of it. Please, you eat the soup. All alone. Waiting for someone to come to me. Wondering what he'll be like. A little afraid that... Ah, the trouble is you, you do not know. You should be strong. And you are not as strong as a newborn baby. You who are to bring one into the world. Oh, pardon. It is your business, not mine. Thanks. An old fool can be a very great old fool when his tongue is not watched. Look, here are your letters. Letters? You brought me letters? Yes. But why didn't you tell See me? See a great package of them. They were tied in a bundle. Oh, let me have them, quick. Ah, ah, now there's light in your eyes. At last his letters reach here. I told you they would come. Oh. Signora, what is wrong? These are my letters. What? All mine. Returned to sender, rejected by censor. My letters. Nothing but mine. He hasn't received one. We will send them again. Suppose he sent them back. No, no, he could not do that. Oh, Ferguson said war-made men think of nothing but themselves. Ah, you're making things up out of your mind because it is tired. War has a way of playing evil jokes, Signora. It is like a jealous person who takes from us... Takes! <laughs> takes! That's what it's done. Taken. That's why he hasn't written. That's why my letters come back. There's no one to receive them. There's no one to write to me. He's gone. Gone. He's dead. Signora. Signora. Oh, Marta, Marta, come up here. Signora has fallen. <laughs> Where have you been, baby? Two days you disappear like a smoke. I look for you. Where is baby, I say? Where is he gone? I went to Milan. Oh, so? She wasn't there. I asked everyone. They don't know where she is. Or if they do, they're not telling me. She... She was going to have a baby. Fergie told me that much. A baby? Hmm, too bad. Well, tomorrow we move up front again. That will make you forget. For I'm not while. moving up front with you, Rinaldi. I'm through with war. But you cannot just stop and say I am through with war. They will not let you do it. If they arrest you, no one can say... I realize all that. They will shoot you. Get this through your head. I'm not going back. I'm going to find Catherine Barkley. She's going to have a baby. My baby. I'm going to find her. And nothing you can say will change that. But... But to suppose that she is no longer Anita. What made you say that? Only because... Uh, you know where she is? Yes, baby. Where? Switzerland, Brissago. How do you know that? Believe me, baby, it is true. Brissago? About 35 kilometers. There will be sentries at the frontier. I know. And you will have to watch out for patrol boats. I'll make it. Here, you may need this money. Take it. You're a good egg, Rinaldi. No, I am a bad egg, baby. But I did not know you... You felt this way about her. You see, baby, I knew all the time where she was. What? I saw by the postmark on her letters, the ones I, 
I sent back to her. You fool, Rinaldi. You poor, blundering fool. I am sorry, baby. I did not... Shut up! I ought to strangle you. But I'll take your money because I need it. I will be lonely without you, baby. You? (laughs) You will write to me. Oh, sure. Maybe my letters will come back, too. Goodbye, Frederico. Don't forget. He will never come back. Never. Curse all wars and women. Who is it? Don't break down the door. This is Switzerland, not war. Well, what do you want? Miss Catherine Barclay, where is she? I don't know. She's gone. That's all I can tell you. She ran away when we wanted to help her. But this is where she lived. Ferguson told me it's where she lived. Who are you? What business is it of yours? So, the soldier who never took the time to write Where to is her, she gone? Letting her sit here alone, growing weaker and Shut weaker. Shut up. There's a hospital here. Eight squares to the left and then three to the right. She might be dead now. No. No, she's not dead. She may be. She may fall. Well, what do you want? Miss Barclay. Do you realize you're dripping water all over the floor? What difference does that make? Is Catherine Barclay here? Yes, she is. Why? I'm her husband. You don't have to look at me like that. I came here as quickly as I could after I found out where she was. How... how is she? Dr. Peters will tell you. He's in with her now. I'll wait until he comes out. But she is all right, isn't she? We don't know. Yet. But people don't die in childbirth nowadays. Some do. She won't die. She's just having a bad time. After it's all over, she'll say it wasn't bad at all. Well, that's what we all hope for. But what reason is there for to die? It's just a child that has to be born and makes trouble and is born, and then you look after it and... And get to love it. Nurse. Oh. Oh, doctor. This is the husband. Is... Is there any danger, doctor? She's very weak. Weak? Yes. The... The baby? A boy. But he was dead. Oh. But she'll be all right. Uh, it's not in my hands any longer. Don't let her die. Oh, God, please don't let her die. I'll do anything for her if you don't let her die. You took the boy. That was all right. Oh, please, God, don't let her die. You wish to go in? Please. All right. Through this door. Now be just as quiet as you can. Frederick, you, you did come. Don't try to move, darling. I, I knew you were coming. You'll be all right, Kevin. I know you'll be all right. When my letters came back, I thought you were dead. I kept on thinking you were dead until last night. Then I knew you were coming. I kept calling to you. It was all Rinaldi's fault. He didn't know. He took your letters and sent them back again. Every one of them. Uh, That was the reason. Yes. Yes, I didn't receive one. It wasn't until two days ago he told me where you were. And all the time I'd been writing to Milan and my letters had been coming back. Because you weren't there. It's all very clear. When you understand everything, isn't it? Yes, dear. You do love me, don't you? You know I do. You love me just as much as you did that evening back in the hospital when the good father married. There hasn't been a moment since then when I haven't loved you. Frederick. Yes, darling. Stop raining, hasn't it? Yes, darling. I hoped it would. Please open the window. But don't stay away from me very long. I want to share every minute there is with you. It's nice with the window open. 
and the outside coming in. Yes. I liked it so much. Living, I mean. Oh, this is just a mean trick. It comes just at the time when I hoped we would... Darling. Catherine. Catherine, what's the matter? Look at me. Catherine. Don't be afraid, darling. Don't ever forget. Don't ever forget. Catherine. Catherine. Oh, my darling. You can't leave me this way. You can't. Catherine. Death is an angel with two faces. To us he turns a face of terror, blighting all things fair. The other burns with glory of the stars, and love is there. We have concluded a farewell to arms. But we have not said farewell to Clark Gable, Josephine Hutchinson, and Adolf Manjou. They will return to us in a moment. Nineteen years ago, the world war ended. But today in this country, we're engaged in another war. The war on crime. An underworld army of over three and one half million thugs rolls up an annual crime cost of fifteen billion dollars. One of the leaders in the fight against the enemy within our gates is now our guest. Head G Man Hoover calls him one of the greatest authorities on crime. He's also a writer of distinction and worked with me on the Plainsman. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Courtney Riley Cooper. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. And here's an interesting angle to those figures you just mentioned. They mean a tax of $120 a year for every man, woman, and child in the United States. But that isn't the worst of it. <laughs> I'm just trying to cheer you up, you know. Government figures show that unless a person dies young, three-fourths of our entire population, directly or indirectly, will be victims of major crimes, like burglary or holdups or manslaughter. Arson or murder. You're, you're quite a sunbeam, aren't you? Uh, can't something be done to clean up this terrible mess? Well, the most hopeful thing about the crime wave is its magnitude. Because at last people are beginning to awaken to what it really means. And its terrible cost in money, in lives, in property. And when the American people wake up to a situation, they usually do something about it. Knowing the rackets as you do, Mr. Cooper, you must be a tough person to victimize. <laughs> you mean I'm a public victim number one. I was robbed three times in the last year. <laughs> one more question. Who was America's most dangerous criminal? John Dillinger? Not at all. It was a woman, Kate Barker. She reared four sons to be murderers, bank robbers, kidnappers, and herself died with a machine gun in her hand. Perhaps you remember the battle at Lake Weir, Florida. About a year or so ago, Ma Barker and her son, Fred, fought off 15 G-men and died with their boots on. But in doing so, they helped the war against crime. For it is things like this that arouse decent, law-abiding citizens to a true realization of what's going on. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. And goodbye. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. I'm sure we're all with you. At this point, our stars return to speak for themselves. Ladies and gentlemen, Clark Gable, Josephine Hutchinson, and Adolf Marjo. Thanks, Mr. DeMille, and thanks to you all who took part with us in tonight's play. There's just a word or two I'd like to say about Adolf Marjo. The story of a farewell to arms is nothing new to him. During the war, Adolf served in the Cornell unit of the United States Ambulance Corps. He was with the first contingent of American troops to land in Italy and really lived the story as Hemingway saw it. He served at Bassano, Monte Tombo, and Genoa, rose from private to captain, and took his detachment over the Alps for the drives in the Argonne and at San Miel, 
Did I get the facts straight, Adolf? Yes, this play brings back many memories. I well recall the hospital where Lieutenant Henry met Catherine. It's in a little town just outside of Genoa, and I was stationed there for several weeks. Now let's see what tonight's Catherine has to report. You look as if you had something on your mind, Josephine. Oh, no. I was just standing here admiring Clark's lovely sideburns. <laughs> oh, well, I, I admit they require a little explanation. Well, you see, I'm playing the part of Charles Stewart Parnell in the picture Parnell, and he lived when sideburns flourished. The studio prefers the homegrown variety, so there was nothing that I could do about it. They certainly are beautiful, Clark. Beautiful. Uh, by the way, they tell me you're a handy man with a rope. <clears throat> yes, I understand they're, they're calling you Buck Gable. <laughs> you, you bring them back alive. Everything from calves to mountain lions. Rope, mountain lions? What's this all about? Oh, no, no, no. There's really nothing at all, Josephine. You know, I, I just get a big kick out of trying to rope calves. You know, a regular drugstore cowboy. Most of the time, the calves win. <laughs> and that business about getting a mountain lion is technically correct, but it was only a 60-pound youngster. I gave him to a trainer, and you may see him in the movies one of these days. Well, if he's going to be a regular picture star, you'd better equate him right now with Lux Toilet Soap. <laughs> but seriously, though, I know of nothing that's kinder to one's complexion than Lux Soap. It's richly earned its right to be called the beauty soap of the stars. And I'm just as happy to pass that word along as I am to be here tonight. Many thanks, and goodbye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Clark Gable, Josephine Hutchinson, and Adolf Manjou. This is your announcer, ladies and gentlemen, Melville Ruick. Another banner evening in the Lux Radio Theater awaits you next Monday night, and Mr. DeMille tells us of it shortly. Our cast tonight included Doris Lloyd as Nurse Ferguson, Lionel Belmore as Rudolph, Martin Provenson as Dr. Peters, Lou Merrill as Bonelli, Justina Wayne as head nurse, Norman Ainsley as Piani, Frank Nelson as a railway clerk, Cornelia Osgood as the Italian nurse, and Ruth Easton as the Swiss nurse. Clark Gable appeared through courtesy of Metro Golden Mayer Studios and will be seen next with Myrna Loy in Parnell, Mr. Borzaghi, Walter Wanger Productions, Mr. DeMille, Paramount, and Louis Silver's 20th Century Fox, where he's in charge of music for Wake Up and Live. As announced last week, today, April 5th, marks the beginning of a very important week to all housewives, National Retail Grocers Week. Be sure to go personally to your grocers during this week. You will be well repaid. Splendid values will be featured generally over a wide list of products you use regularly. Incidentally, you will find in the great majority of stores from coast to coast special values on Lux Flakes and Lux Toilet Soap. And now, back to Mr. DeMille. Our production next Monday night is taken from the Sidney Howard adaptation of a story that met with phenomenal success as a novel, a play, and a motion picture. Dodsworth by Sinclair Lewis. And we're proud to announce that the title role will be filled by the same brilliant performer who created it on stage and screen, Walter Houston. With him, with him from the original Broadway cast will be his wife, Nan Sunderland, as Edith Cartwright, and Faye Bainter as Fran. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Walter Houston, Nan Sunderland, and Faye Bainter in Dodsworth. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. I'm Jeffrey Lyons, hoping you enjoyed AMC's Lux Radio Theater presentation of A Farewell to Arms, starring Clark Gable, Josephine Hutchinson, and Adolph Monju. Originally broadcast over CBS Radio April 5th, 
1937. This broadcast was based on the 1932 film version of A Farewell to Arms, which owes as much to the shimmering house style of Paramount Pictures as it does to the highly acclaimed adaptation of Ernest Hemingway's 1929 novel. Now, if Hemingway purists can get past the romanticizing of the novel, the film offers its own glittery appeal. On the Italian front in World War I, an American ambulance driver, played by Gary Cooper, falls hard for a nurse, played by Helen Hayes. Cooper was, in real life, a close friend of Hemingway, and later played the hero of Hemingway's For Whom the Bell Tolls. Directed by Frank Borzage, A Farewell to Arms received Oscar nominations for Best Picture, Best Art Direction, for Cinematography and Sound. It won for Best Sound and for ace cameraman Charles Lang's brilliant cinematography. Lang's lush black and white could skillfully capture the glow from a cigarette as it played across Cooper's darkened face. And the jaded battle scene showed the influence of the hit film All Quiet on the Western Front, especially in the gripping montage depicting Cooper's progress alone through the war zone. A quality remake followed in 1957, starring Rock Hudson and Jennifer Jones, directed by Charles Vidor and produced by David O. Selznick. Hello, and thank you for downloading Witness from the BBC World Service. And today, we're taking you back to Christmas Eve nearly a century ago, when the fighting stopped on the battlefields of France during the First World War. Alan Johnston reports. It is Christmas Eve 1914 in the trenches in Flanders. There have been months of fighting and tens of thousands of men have been killed. But near the French town of Armentier, a calm has settled on the battlefront. It is a freezing, moonlit night, and in the silence, a young British soldier, Rifleman Graham Williams, is on sentry duty, peering out into no man's land. Many years later, he described what happened. I was standing there on duty, gazing across, looking towards the German parapet. I thought, well, a very different Christmas this is going to be from... Well, anyway, I've spent up till now. I thought about this time, I tell them we should have finished putting up all the greenery and holly and stuff. And my father would have been just finished making his rum punch, which he always did at Christmas. Anyway, I thought, my well, I could just do with a swig of that rum punch now, and they're feeling pretty miserable altogether. Then all of a sudden, lights appeared all along the German trench. And I thought, well, that's a funny thing. And I, then the Germans started singing, still a nacht, Heiliger Nacht. And I, I woke up, with all the other sentries did the same thing. We all woke up the other people to come along and see this, what on earth's going on. They finished their carol, we applauded them, and then we thought we were... We must retaliate in some way. So we, we replied with the first Noel. And when we'd finished that, they all began clapping. And then uh, they struck up their another favourite carol of theirs, O Tannenbaum. First the Germans singing one of their carols, then we'd sing another of ours. Until uh, we started up, Come All Ye Faithful, and the Germans immediately joined in, singing the same thing to the Latin words of Adeste Fidelis. And, uh, well, I thought this was rather an extraordinary idea, thing, really, to think of the two nations both singing the same carol in the middle of the war. All along the front lines that night, the men of the two armies began to reach out to each other. A soldier with the Royal Welsh Fusiliers, Private Frank Richards, remembered how the men in his trench made contact with the help of a Christmas message that they'd written on a board. We stuck a board up, Merry Christmas. They also stuck one up, Merry Christmas. So we were saying, well, I don't think they'll, they'll fire today. No, I don't think they will. Then lo and behold, here was a German coming down the river bank with his hands up above. One of our chaps threw his equipment off. He went out to meet him. Well, they shook hands. Then we all got out. Company commander come rushing in. He was going to shoot any man that went over voice from the next bay said you were too damn late. So we all had to get out. Well, we mucked in all day. 
talking with one thing or another. One of the gentlemen said to me, and in excellent English, too, well, he said, I don't know, he said, how long do you think this damn war is going to last? I'm fed up to the neck. Oh, he said, you were not the only one fed up. I said, we're up to our necks in water and mud. He said, we're the same. Of course, the officers have to get out then, and uh, they uh, sent for the couple of Germans back and they brought some decanters and the officers, you know, they had a damn good drink between them, <laughs> see? And our company commander gave them a plum pudding and they asked our company commander if he'd mind uh, the company having two barrels of beer. He said, we've got plenty there in the brewery. He said, he'd, and he said, I can assure you, it won't make them drunk. So right all the two Germans wheeled uh, two barrels out into the middle of no man's land. We rolled them back in the trench. And there were scenes just like the one Private Richards described up and down the battlefront. Men who had been trying to kill one another for months emerged cautiously from behind their defences, shook hands, began to chat and share their rations and drink together. And on more than one patch of no man's land there were games of football. One reported result has a familiar feel to it. Germany 3, England 2. But what really counted was that where there had been war, suddenly, almost unbelievably, there was peace and goodwill. Years later, a German major remembered his meeting with an English officer called Sir Edward Hulse. This is what he wrote. As regards the Christmas armistice, the initiative was not taken by us, but by the Englishmen. On Christmas Day at about 11 o'clock, there was continuous waving of a white flag from the English trench, which was about a hundred and fifty yards from ours. Soon afterwards, a number of them climbed out of the trench and came towards our front, making signs all the time. My commander, Major Baron von Blomberg, ordered me to find out what they wanted. Accompanied by an English-speaking volunteer, I went out to meet the Englishmen. Under the surprised gaze of the men in the trenches on both sides, the preliminary greetings exchanged were of a rather embarrassed nature. We heard that it was the wish of the Englishmen to bury, on the Christmas holiday, their dead, who were lying before the front, and they asked us to seize enemy action for an adequate period. What were we to do? Time was short. There was no time for making inquiries of the superior department. Major von Blomberg therefore decided that there should be a local armistice until one o'clock in the afternoon, telling the Englishmen that their dead must be buried by that time. While the English soldiers performed their sad task, I chatted with the then Lieutenant Sir Edward Hulse, and I handed him a Victoria Cross and letters which had belonged to an English captain who had fallen in our trench in the course of the attack of December the 18th. Touched by this respectful treatment of the belongings of one of his fallen comrades, Lieutenant Hulse took off his silk shawl and handed it to me as a memento of this Christmas day. I felt so embarrassed by this gesture that I sent to the lieutenant on the same evening from my Christmas gifts a pair of fur gloves. Only on New Year's Day, when a single shot, fired from the English, killed a sentry, did this Christmas peace, which I shall never forget, come to an end. Nowhere would the truce hold for more than a matter of days. The British and German generals had been astonished at the reports of camaraderie in no man's land. On both sides they issued the sternest orders. There was to be no more fraternisation with the enemy. Informal truces were to cease and there were threats of court-martials. Gradually, all along the line, gunshots began to ring out again. Snipers started picking off their targets once more, and over time there was a return to all-out war. It would last for nearly four more years, and by the time the conflict ended, millions of soldiers had been killed.
For many of those men who ventured out into no man's land during the truce, that Christmas in 1914 would be their last. Among them was the English officer who gave away his silk shawl as a gift and received the gloves in return. Sir Edward Hulse was killed in battle less than three months later. Alan Johnston. For details of our complete range of downloads and our terms of use, go to bbcworldservice.com slash podcasts. If uh, you would analyze the meaning of the word man, the greatest example I could give, one of the greatest examples I could give would be Rick. He's a man, and he's all man, every bit of it. All of us were sore at him at one time or another. Uh, Rickenbacker used that method of getting us mad enough at him that we were going to live to spite him. Rick would withhold his fire until he could frankly see the whites of the fellow's eyes, and he never missed. From my point of view, he could properly be considered the dean of the air transport industry. Who stands today as a captain of industry, and who in the past has received America's highest award, the Congressional Medal of Honor. Captain Eddie is a man who has been near death many times, a man who fought against all odds to retain life. He is a man who has fought this country's battles and won, an ace of aces in the First World War, and later, a stubborn visionary who had enough faith in the air age to build one of the country's major air services. This is Eddie Rickenbacker, a tough, wiry fighter, loved by some, feared by others, but respected by all. A tough man who believes in perseverance and hard work. His good friend Arthur Godfrey puts it this way. If uh, you would analyze the meaning of the word man, the greatest example I could give, one of the greatest examples I could give would be Rick. He's a man and he's all man, every bit of it. Uh, he's a man like Kurt LeMay's a man, like J. Edgar Hoover's a man. They're... Uh, Human, they're warm, they're big hearted. Uh, Rick is full of the love of his country, he's unafraid to die for his country. Uh, he, uh, he's the old school, you know. He, he has no time whatever for uh, this sloppy business of missing education and not working. You know, every time I see him, I saw him here about a month ago, and I said, doggone it, Rick, you look better now than you did five years ago. What are you doing? He says, working. <laughs> <laughs> work, work, work is what does it, see? Eddie started this work at an early age. In fact, he was only 12 years old back in 1901 when he took his first job at $3.50 a week in a glass factory in Columbus, Ohio. His father, William, had just died, leaving his mother, Elizabeth, and seven other children. Eddie was well able to take care of himself. He'd smoked cigarettes by the time he was in the first grade, and he got into so many fights that he seemed to be trying to cultivate two permanent black eyes. But when the time came, he felt his responsibility and rose to it. In the next three years, he tried his hand at a variety of jobs. He was a foundry worker, a monument polisher, and a railroad roustabout. But then came 1905. And young Eddie found his great love, the internal combustion engine. Soon, Eddie became a crack mechanic, but this wasn't enough. He wanted to get behind the wheel, and it wasn't long before he achieved this goal. Well, I think my first uh, contact with Ed was at Sioux City, Iowa in 1913. Tommy Milton drove against Eddie many times after that as they pursued their hard and dangerous life across the continent. Uh, some promoters had scraped up a... Uh, prairie and made a track out of it and Ed was there with what was the predecessor of the Duesenberg car. It was a th three-day meet uh, but the feature event was 
Oh, I think 150, maybe 200 miles, which Rick won in a very spectacular drive. I recall a race at uh, Columbus, Ohio, which incidentally I believe was Rick's hometown. Uh, and I think Rick was driving one of the Maxwell cars, which had been built by Ray Haroon. And he was leading the race. But the thing got away from him. He went through the outer fence. As I recall, Rick was not at all seriously injured in the mishap, however. Rick was much inclined to go out in front, and as long as his car stayed under him, he stayed out in front. That isn't necessarily the best way to win races. It's a lot of fun, though. Rickenbacker became a headliner, but he never came in better than 10th in the 500-mile race at Indianapolis. But he did set a new world speed record with the Blitz and Benz at Daytona Beach. But war threatened to step into this racing career, and Eddie had an idea. He wanted to organize the country's top racing drivers into a special flying unit that would be prepared to go overseas if the United States entered the war then raging in Europe. The government turned down his suggestion, but this didn't stop Eddie. He wanted to fly, and he would make it, one way or another. He started from the ground up. Over there, over there, send the word, send the word, over there. Seven weeks after the U.S. declared war, Eddie was sworn in as a sergeant and went overseas as a driver attached to General Pershing's staff. And later he was assigned to drive Billy Mitchell around France. Eddie pestered the famous airman for a chance to fly, and the badgering finally paid off, even though he had to lie about his age. He was almost 27, two years over the limit for pilots, but he made it. On completion of his flying school, he was transferred to Issoudun Field as engineering officer. We had not been in Issoudun but a few days, and under these very bad conditions, uh, when we found that uh, everyone in command uh, had a German name. Reed Chambers, another immortal of the 94th Pursuit Squadron, tells what it was like at group headquarters. Uh, Carl Spotts, at that time he spelled it S-P-A-A-T-Z. Of course, we later found out that he was a Pennsylvania Dutchman. And as you all know, he became one of our great generals in World War II was officer in charge of flying. Uh, Herman Spiegel was officer in charge of transportation. Uh, Captain Wiedenbach uh, was adjutant, and Tittle was sergeant major. Wiedenbach and Tittle had both uh, served in the German army, although they were naturalized American citizens, and spoke with a very decided German accent. In view of the fact that we were being treated as enlisted men, uh, and there were no airplanes to fly, no uh, flying fields to fly them off of it, uh, we were, of course, uh, very low in morale. And uh, it wasn't too long until we made up our minds that the officers in charge of Isabdun were a bunch of dirty German saboteurs. Uh, and uh, we uh, found that a guy in charge of engineering was named Rickenbacker. When he arrived, none of the gang would even speak to him. But I went up and uh, said hello, and uh, we uh, immediately... Uh, started teaming up. With that, uh, my own crowd ostracized me. So that uh, none of the people that I had learned to fly with in the United States would talk to uh, Rickenbacker, and they wouldn't talk to me because I would talk to Rickenbacker. Those were rough days for Eddie. First he was grounded, and then ostracized by his fellow flyers. But the time finally came when he was to take his first patrol over enemy territory with Douglas Campbell, another green airman. About the end of March 1918, when our squadron had just been formed and equipped and was at uh, a place called Villeneuve near Epernay in the Champagne district of France, uh, Major Raoul Loughberry, uh, who had made a great name for himself as an ace in the 
Lafayette Escadrille and had been uh, and had transferred to the United States Air Service and was uh, one of the flight commanders of our squadron uh, asked Rick and myself to uh, accompany him on a patrol over the lines near Rance. We were, of course, uh, delighted and excited because it was our first try at it. So we took off in our Newport 28s, and uh, he led us over the lines up and down for uh, perhaps an hour and a half, an hour and three quarters, which was the extent of our fuel supply in those aircraft. Uh, but it seemed uh, most of the time a little dull. We uh, were encountered some anti-aircraft fire uh, shortly after we got near the lines, which was uh, a surprise, uh, but one which we uh, learned to get used to. But aside from that, uh, it was a cold, gray day with a high ceiling, and uh, there didn't seem to be any particular activity going on, uh, either on the ground or in the air. But when we came back uh, and landed at our uh, airdrome, uh, Luftberry asked us to report what we'd seen. So we reported the anti-aircraft bursts that had been near us. And that was all. Lusbury laughed and said, Well, I thought you fellows probably wouldn't see much your first flight over. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, a flight of French spads uh, passed fairly close underneath us. There was another flight of uh, French spads uh, off to the side at one time. And just before we... uh, started back to our landing field. There were three or four uh, German albatross and a German observation plane uh, just on the other side of the lines, not very far away from us. But uh, I knew that green pilots uh, don't see much the first time up, so I was reluctant to uh, attack them and get you fellas into trouble. (laughs) That's the way it went on that first flight, but it was just a start for Eddie. About a month later, on April 29th, 1918, he shot down his first German plane, an Albatross single-seater. He did this by driving his Newport out of the sun until he was less than 150 yards from his quarry before opening fire. This is the way he fought. But there were other airmen with Eddie, airmen such as Leroy Prinz, now dance director at Metro Golden Mayor, who had fun and made merry even while flying. Ty, I have 18 official planes to my credit. Um, all American, of course. In fact, I was probably the only man in the 94th Squadron that went, that had such a credit. And I, my, my title was Crash Ace. Of course, people ask me why, and I always tell them, well, we couldn't all be heroes in the 94th. Rickenbacker was setting such a terrific pace. The Germans had to shoot somebody down, and <clears throat> so I was elected. Unfortunately, being short, I, I, I wasn't too good a pilot. And I got called on the carpet by Rickenbacker, and uh, he said he thought maybe it would be good for me to be assigned to General Mitchell as an aide-de-camp, uh, which later turned out for decorations officer. And I asked him what would be this particular reason. He said he thought it would be good for two reasons. He thought I'd be a good man the general staff in Showmont, and also, and his face got a little red, and he blared up, he said he wanted to build up the Air Force a little bit. Seemed like I was taking them down faster than the Germans were. In fact, he said I was the only German ace in the American Air Force. Well, my official job was to get in a truck and come back with a load of nurses. I seemed to be able to manage and round them up all the time, and... uh, and down in this gullies we'd go where a table would be set up and we'd manage to have music and a dance, etc. And, of course, invariably they were broken up because 
Hartford, and every night we had a visit from the Germans. I know how tough it was to have the light go out with nothing but a lot of nurses around. That was murder. With Eddie, it was a serious business. He hunted with coldness and logic. Not a fancy pilot, but a fighter. On the ground, he checked his engine himself, and for fear of jamming his guns in combat, he examined every bullet himself before he loaded his machine gun belt. Colonel Fred Ordway, now of Washington, describes Eddie's approach to his job. Eddie Rickenbacker, as I've always said, was uh, much older and more matured. He was a, um, a disciplinarian, an excellent fighter, very careful and calculating. Uh, he did not believe in, in taking unnecessary chances. He uh, was quite the opposite of Frank Luke who uh, would not hesitate to dive into a formation of enemy enemy aircraft when he was outnumbered five or six or seven to one. That didn't worry Frank Luke in the least. Eddie Rickenbacker was uh, much more careful and calculating and uh, didn't believe in, in taking uh, unnecessary risks. He was very strict in regard to uh, the manner in which the pilots conducted themselves and around the airfield and, and, of course, in combat. And he was also very careful in protecting younger pilots on their first trips over the lines. He was um, would be inclined to fly above them, and if they were attacked and in a dangerous position, he would dive in on the enemy aircraft and either shoot it down or chase it away. This has been Eddie's way of doing things throughout his life. Rick, of course, is a, is a, is a hard taskmaster because... He doesn't drive anybody, he leads them, but he sets a terrific example. Real leaders are that way. They set the example, lead the way, and show the way, and you just naturally fall in behind them. And he has no, he has nothing but contempt for anybody who's lazy. Yes, Eddie was a hard taskmaster in those days, but he was no longer ostracized by his fellow pilots who had begun to love him, even though they had described him as a tough hombre. He was now a flamboyant figure in his britches and fancy non-regulation British boots, probably the shiniest in the American Expeditionary Force. And on September 24th, 1918, he was commissioned a captain and put in command of the squadron. Eddie started out rather dramatically in his new post. Before breakfast on his first day of command, he attacked seven German planes single-handedly and shot down two. This feat later won for him the Congressional Medal of Honor. The 94th Squadron at this time was caught in the final big effort of the war. There were no leads and virtually no rest for the pilots. Reed Chambers, who flew with Eddie throughout this period, knows from first-hand knowledge just how Rickenbacker achieved such success. Rick and I uh, got permission to uh, fly uh, voluntary patrols together. And after our regular formations, uh, we would take off and uh, go uh, out uh, on hunting expeditions. Remember that the planes we're flying then had a top speed even downhill of about 130 miles an hour. Um, he had had lots of racing experience and around 100 miles an hour during hubcap to hubcap. Uh, <clears throat> I could out uh, fly Rick, I'd get on his tail and stay there. I could shoot uh, more holes in a towed target than he could. But uh, when the target started shoot back, shooting back at me, that was a horse of a different color. Uh, Rick, uh, I, w I would start uh, shooting at an enemy plane uh, uh, at, uh, too, uh, too far away and as a result missed many shots. W Rick would withhold his fire until he could practically see the whites of the fellow's eyes and he never missed. Uh, he was a terrific judge of distance. I, he only made one mistake, and one day he did pull up uh, a little too close and uh, clipped a German albatross with his tail skid and pulled the German's wing off. Uh, he uh, got him by actually colliding with him without getting hurt himself. Rick and I, when we were going out alone, would always have a little private briefing and decide where we were going to go hunting and what clouds we were going to look over and under. 
And uh, we developed a favorite expression, which we used uh, always as we would part to get into our respective airplanes. And that was, well, baby, I'll be slapping you in the face with a spade. And uh, uh, it uh, sort of became funny to us, because sometimes we weren't sure which was going to slap who in the face with a spade. On October 30th, 1918, just before sundown, Eddie landed his plane after shooting down a Fokker and a balloon. Those were his last victories in the war. And when the armistice was signed on November 11th, the score was official. 26 planes shot down in seven months. The end of the war for that colorful figure in his tight breeches, a man who had kept two spad pursuit planes, each bearing the number one in the famed Hat in the Ring insignia, who had landed one, gulped coffee, and took off in another, flying as much as seven hours a day. But the war was over. No longer would Eddie and his fellow pilots make up such squadron ballads as this one. When the final taps have sounded and we lay aside life's cares and we fly our last old spad on heaven's golden stairs and the angels bid us welcome and the harps begin to play tis then we'll hear St. Peter as he greets us with a yell front seats for you of 94 for you've done your hitch in hell. Eddie and his friends were a rough, tough, rollicking bunch of flyers, but real pioneers in the air. They lived hard and furious, but Reed Chambers knew another side of Eddie. Rick was always religious. He and I uh, uh, lived together uh, practically all the time we were on the front. And every night, Rick would kneel by the side of his bed and uh, put his head in his arms. And uh, while he... uh, uh, made no sound. I uh, still am convinced that he was praying. Uh, in fact, uh, his religion, uh, for my money, is far better than uh, that of uh, most of the creeds that I know of. If everybody lived like Rick does, it would be a far better world. Captain Eddie came home to a hero's welcome, big reception, endless speeches. But when these had ended, Eddie embarked on the first phase of his business career. Maybe folks would argue with me about this, but I think the greatest single contribution he has made to America is the example that he sets. Even today, uh, as a businessman... As a rugged individualist, as a man who who uh, who likes to try to make things stand on their own feet and pay their own way, and and uh, a man who stands for less and less government interference in the in private industry, uh, as a champion of real economics in industry, that's that's the kind of a thing he's doing. But Eddie's first really big business venture was not going to be a success. He wanted to build the great American car. And he and three Detroit automobile men formed the Rickenbacker Motor Company. It was organized in 1922 with $5 million capital. This dream child was unveiled in New York and at first was a big success. The Rickenbacker looked like a sure winner. And it was difficult to keep up with the demand for the car. It had many engineering firsts, including four-wheel brakes. But this innovation proved to be a detriment, at least at that time. The car was criticized, and the brakes were described as dangerous because they brought the car to a stop too suddenly. Finally, this criticism, coupled with the 1925 slump, brought to a close Eddie's dream of a great American car, and it left him with a quarter of a million dollar debt, which he swore he'd pay off, and he did, later. More and more he turned to the aircraft industry, and while working for General Motors was connected with the Fokker Aircraft Corporation and Eastern Airlines, then owned by the big corporation. Another company owned by General Motors at that time was Eastern Airlines. Alfred P. Sloan, former president of General Motors and later chairman of the board. At that time, in 1934, 
Eddie had charge of what was then the General Motors East and Airlines Division. Finally, the time was reached when the corporation decided to remain in manufacturing and dispose of its interest in aeroplane operation. This necessitated the sale of our Eastern Airlines division. Eddie was much interested and extremely anxious to work out something whereby he could take over our interest in aeroplane operation. I am reminded of how he telephoned me shortly before Christmas in 1938. It so happened that his opportunity to purchase the property expired the next day. While he had promises of financial support, he had nothing tangible to offer. He was, of course, worried and upset, as he naturally would be. He decided to call me at 11 o'clock on a Saturday night and asked if he could come in for a few minutes. Of course, I told him he certainly could. He comments on the fact that on his arrival, he found me in pajamas, a robe, and slippers. He never was able to quite figure out whether he had wakened me, got me out of bed, or how it happened. Anyhow, eh, we had a discussion on the subject. I told him further, I did not know just what the status was as it was being handled by the financial people in General Motors. But I promised him I would look into the matter immediately, and if a commitment had not been made, I would assure him a real opportunity to see what he might do, and further, not to worry about it. Eddie rounded up three and a half million dollars in 30 hectic days. I can't talk from the standpoint of his colorful exploits as an automobile racer, or a fire in World War I, uh, because I didn't know him at that time. But I can speak uh, from very definite knowledge of that phase of his life with which I've had the closest contact, namely his business career. Hugh Nelton of the investment firm of Kuhn Loeb tells why the financial world had confidence in Eddie, even though his Rickenbacker car of the 20s had been a failure. Twenty years ago... In the spring of 1938, my firm had an important part in the purchase of Eastern Airlines from General Motors. At that time, this airline was a mere fledgling. It was doing a business, a total business, at a rate under $5 million a year. Eddie Rickenbacker's confidence in the future of this enterprise was terrific. It was unflagging and it was contagious. But even so, it required a real element of faith because no one had yet demonstrated the ability to make an airline profitable. That that Eddie Rickenbacker's talents were equal to this challenge is certainly most dramatically shown by this fact. Eastern Airlines has operated profitably every year since that time. This is an outstanding record in the industry, and today this little acorn, which, uh, 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 this little acorn of 1938 has grown into a tremendous oak, now operating at an annual rate not of $5 million, as in 1937, but $265 million, a growth of 5,200%. All under the leadership of Eddie Rickenbacker. This time there was no doubt Eddie had become a successful businessman, a captain of industry. Along the way, he had bought the Indianapolis Speedway at a cost of $700,000. But now, once again, his great love was the airplane and air transportation. Alfred P. Sloan again had a conversation with Eddie, and again, Captain Eddie suggested something based on what he had seen in Europe. He had been in England, through the Middle East, and Russia on confidential missions for the government. On his return, he came in to see me, and we had lunch together and discussed aviation technique from its various angles. At that time, he was enthusiastic about the potentiality of jet turbine power for aeroplanes, as was being developed in England, Russia, and Germany. He felt that a great corporation like General Motors should be involved in this development, 
both for the sake of our national security and our general economy looking to the future. You also urged upon me the fact that our government and our military services are far behind the English, Germans, and the Russians in the development of this type of power. How fully subsequent events have proved Eddie's keen foresight. But Eddie's contribution to the advancement of our society has been far broader than his initial interest in the automobile industry and later service as an airplane executive. He has distinguished himself as an American at the highest level of patriotism and service to the welfare of his country, both in war and in peace. We will return to Biography and Sound, Captain Eddie the Iron Eagle, after a pause for station identification. Captain Eddie was continually on the watch for new developments in the aircraft industry. From my point of view, he could properly be considered the dean of the air transport industry. Lawrence Rockefeller, a director of Eastern Airlines and a friend of Eddie's, sums it up this way. Someone who brought uh, the discipline of business method and accounting of economy and far-sighted planning into the industry. He uh, expects to get uh, the cooperation and backing of his associates and he takes a good deal of convincing to convince him that maybe he is wrong. If he is, naturally he recognizes it, but just vacillating opinions or casual guesses uh, don't make much impression on him. You have to be factual and you have to have a good deal of steam behind your facts if you're going to change his point of view. He is amazing, though, because he is such a great leader, and yet he does have this kind of, you know, this mm -hmm. ability to go down into the organization and listen and get facts. But still, as leader, he makes the decisions. Yes, Eddie Rickenbacker was now firmly established as the well-publicized president of Eastern Airlines and was in the news again and again. One veteran newspaper man who got to know him well was Jim Kilgallen of International News Service. My association with him has gone back 35 or 40 years. Let's see. Yeah. I had known him back since the days when he was fooling with cars and was going to be a race driver back there in Indianapolis where the famous Speedway is. He was always a, a straight, honest, a gosh sort of a fellow, down to earth, feet on the ground, not a bit of pretense about him. Uh, he's one of these men who uh, makes a million friends but doesn't hesitate to make an enemy. Uh, Rickenbacker was in the past often taken a stand on something which was unpopular and he would draw criticism but he's a type that uh, uh, never backed up I don't know whether it's any good to rake it up now but uh, he didn't believe certain things and said so in speeches and he would get uh subjected to a lot of criticism, but he didn't seem to mind it. Eddie capitalized on his own popularity, making friends for Eastern. He also collected an assortment of enemies. Organized labor was openly against him for his wartime criticism. And labor didn't react in too friendly a fashion when Eddie reminded them that he had been a working stiff too and had been glad to get a dollar a day. He put this criticism behind him and continued to fly Eastern's routes minutely examining every phase of the operation. On one of these trips, he wound up in South America with Arthur Godfrey. I think the most amusing incident we had was in Santiago in Chile. We uh, were there just in time to witness a minor revolution. And they brought out the Carabinieri, I think they call it. Carabinieri, the, the uh, police, who have little short... Tommy guns. And by George, they they put on a shooting match right there in the city square, right in front of the hotel where we were. And then it died down, and we thought it was over, and we had a dinner date, a high-level dinner we were supposed to go to, right down one of the streets off the square. 
And we started down that street, Rick and I, and some of the other uh, people who were on the trip with us. And uh, as we walked down this street, a very narrow street with high stone walls on each side, uh, a fusillade of bullets, a hail of them came down that street. And they were going ping, 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 and banging off the walls on either side of us. We turned around and started running. And I thought I was going fast, but here come Rick past me saying, what's holding you up, boy? <laughs> and we, as he said, we went back to our hotel to previously prepared positions at the bar and thought it over. That trip was exciting but fun. Another trip ended in tragedy. On the afternoon of February 26, 1941, Eddie boarded a plane in New York, bound for Mexico City with stops in Washington and Atlanta. The time came when the plane should have been over Atlanta Airport ready to start an instrument landing in the fog. The pilots started to set the plane down. A split second later, a wing hit the treetops. The plane hit the ground 10 miles outside the city. Ralph McGill, editor of the Atlanta Constitution, was in the rescue party when it reached the scene of the crash. As dawn broke, uh, we found ourselves really almost on the wreck. And, of course... Seen literally through a a drifting curtain of fog, it was an an awful sight, as those things always are. So there they lay, the DC-3, one of the most completely wrecked aircraft I've ever seen. The front of the airplane was almost mangled, as if it had been run through some great set of teeth, well past the cockpit, and into the first row or two of seats. At any rate, we we began to lift up these tangled and broken pieces of wreckage. And up near the front, I would say about a third of the way back in the cabin, or where the cabin normally would be, we found Captain Rickenbacker. We first thought we had found his body. Someone said, leaning down and feeling his pulse, uh, he's dead. What we didn't know at the time was that one of the news agency men set out then, because Captain Rickenbacker was the most notable passenger aboard the plane, he set out and and ran through the mud and the thickets uh, uh, about a mile or a little more to a telephone and flashed in the word that Captain Rickenbacker was dead. We were holding the presses in Atlanta, and uh, we started out with an extra of this. Fortunately, uh, the later word got in, and none of the papers uh, got on the street, but uh, the headline did say Rickenbacker dead. At any rate, to go back to the wreck, we finally got him moved out, and then... uh, By putting a hand up under his shirt, one could feel a very faint heartbeat. We didn't quite believe it at first. It was a night of trial for Eddie. His skull was crushed, his left arm broken, his left eye was bloodied, both legs were broken, and his lungs were cut by jagged stubs of ribs. But through it all, Eddie managed to keep the other survivors from destroying themselves. He could hear some groans, he could hear... Somebody calling for help every now and then, and people talking, praying, and that sort of thing. And uh, he kept calling to them, don't light a match. Don't light a match. Uh, uh, Don't uh, use a lighter, a cigarette lighter. Because he knew if any flame should have come, the whole thing would have gone up and, and everyone would have been burned to death. Eddie was taken to Piedmont Hospital in Atlanta, where he lay in a coma for many days. I was there the day that he became conscious for the first time. He had, of course, been under an oxygen tent. And uh, he began to stir around. The nurse notified the doctors. And uh, they came in. And uh, he opened up at one eye and... Looked around, spoke to people, and he said, I'm hungry. Well, of course, that delighted everyone. 
They'd been hoping for that because the only thing he'd had in the way of food was some intravenous feeding. And uh, so Dr. McRae said, Well, that's wonderful, Eddie. What would you like? Captain Rickenbacker reflected and he said, Well, I'll tell you, Doctor, I have an appetite right now for a ham sandwich and maybe a bottle of beer. It was almost four months before Eddie got out of the hospital. Then, war again. December 7th, and the attack on Pearl Harbor. One day, General Hap Arnold, commander of the Army Air Forces, called Eddie and proposed a job. That is, if he felt well enough to do it. Eddie did. He was to make a flying tour to every Air Force combat unit and instill in the men the sense of conquest that is the core of combat psychology. Said General Arnold, Tell Rick... I want them to put turpentine under their tails. I want to get those youngsters fighting mad. Eddie did just that. Then there was a trip to Russia and a story told by Eddie to actor Adolf Manju. They just got back from Moscow and he gave me a, a Russian bill, autographed it as a souvenir, which I added to my short snorter, which everybody had at that time. And he told me a very interesting uh, thing that had happened. The uh, Russians... As, as is their uh, custom, decided to try to get him drunk. And uh, they were drinking vodka out of uh, water glasses, like water. And uh, Rickenbacker, not to show the white feather, he, said, he turned to his aide and said, you stand behind me and hold me up, because I'm going to drink glass for glass for these fellas. And when it was over, he said, they were on the floor, not me. He was being propped. A tough man, Eddie. Finally, he was asked, to make a tour of our Pacific bases. Eddie and Colonel Hans C. Adamson left for Honolulu with a stopover in Los Angeles so that he could see his mother and brother Dewey. It was October 1942. Eddie was to leave Hickam Field in a flying fortress bound for Australia with a stop at Canton Island, just a speck in the Pacific. That plane never made Canton Island. And with that, started a long ordeal for Captain Eddie. James Reynolds, who now lives in Oakland, California, was the radio operator on that ill-fated Flying Fortress. As near as I remember, it was around 4 o'clock in the afternoon. We knew that we were going to have to find land fairly soon or we were going to have to set it down in the water. Well, you have roughly 25 ton of airplane. We had Bombay tanks that were empty. The wing tanks were nearly empty. And Bill Cherry made one of the finest landings I've ever seen or heard of since. He brought it in tail low, hit the crest of one wave, went into the air again, and then skidded it around to set the body of the plane, the fuselage of the plane, into the trough. When we crashed, uh, after taking to the rafts, we counted up what food we had. We had four very anemic Southern California oranges and a package of fish line and hooks that come in a jungle kit on the back of a parachute. We split those oranges up and made them last as long as we could, more for the fluid than anything else. The rest of the time we lived on fish. We managed to catch two with the line that had been taken by one of the members. Two jumped into the raft, being chased by larger fish, and we caught one shark. But they were so strong and rancid, we couldn't get anywhere near it, even after drying it out. And we managed to catch a few fish that would hide underneath the raft from the larger fish. They were small, inch, two inches long. And all of us, Rick included, ate them tail, feathers, and all. Back here in the United States, Eddie's friends just couldn't believe he had died. Their reaction was much the same as this, expressed by Arthur Godfrey. Oh, no, no, not Eddie. He'll be back. Yes, we, we knew he was all right somewhere. Because, uh, you know, this survival business is uh, lots of luck, yes. But there's also a great deal in the preparation a man makes. The man was... Uh, Rick was, was mentally prepared, if you know what I mean. And, of course, Eddie wasn't dead. Far from it. During those long hours on the cramped raft, Eddie was unyielding in his firm discipline, and as a result, 
kept a firm hand on the actions of the others. Well, he's a shrewd person, very shrewd. He must have been to get where he is today. Uh, I don't believe the man is ruthless or would hurt anyone intentionally. But my best description of the man, if you hated him, hated these guts, you'd have to admire him for them. Rickenbacker didn't wander off uh, as much on a tangent as the most of us did in our minds. His mind stayed, I would say, as clear, if not clearer, than the rest of us. One uh, night, Colonel Adamson went over the side to try to end it all. Uh, he was the only one hurt in the actual crash, but uh, Rick and myself and one of the others pulled him back in, and I've heard a man get a tongue lashing, and being an old friend of Rick's, Adamson took it. But I'd hate to get one like it myself. Eddie's discipline throughout those long days and nights of desperation was probably resented by some of the other occupants of the rafts, but he continued to harass them. I don't believe the man knows the word of fear. He might, uh, he might internally, but Rickenbacker never displayed, uh, displayed a element of fear whatsoever. There's only one incident that I remember where he was really, Rick was really pushed out of shape was when he caught one of them drinking more water than he should have at the time because we were on rations, very strict rations. We had no water at all for the first eight days and for the remainder of the time, the most we had any one day was a jigger of water, about an ounce of water a day. He told him that the rest of our lives depended on uh, that water. Uh, our water came from catching rainwater in our underclothes, our socks, our pants, our shirts, and wringing them out into a bucket and then taking them into our mouth and mouthing them inside of, through the tubes inside of a May West life jacket. So we had very little water the whole period of time out there. And uh, he really laid the law down to him that uh, every Catch him, uh, catch him doing it again, why it might lead to uh, severe punishment if we were ever picked up. I think all of us were sore at him at one time or another. Uh, uh, Rick was uh, a man that kept at you to keep you going, if nothing else. And uh, Lieutenant Whitaker, the co-pilot, said he was going to live just to spite him. Finally, after 24 days of torture, 24 days of sun of hunger and of thirst, came an answer to the long hours of prayer. Planes came out of the sky, passed over, then returned, passed over again and left. But they did return, landed, and thus achieved one of the most famous rescues of all time. It was the end of an ordeal. Captain Eddie Rickenbacker tells of the effects of those 24 long days on a raft. I've often been asked, particularly in recent years, what effect that experience has had, if any, what it left. Frankly, physically, it has never left anything detrimental or mentally detrimental. Spiritually, it has left a wonderful feeling of the unbelievable almost. Because when I got back, I found that the world at large seemed interested. That may sound egotistical, but the newspapers showed that there was tremendous interest in the fact that we'd been picked up and rescued, particularly me. And I analy as I analyzed it, it brought to mind the fact that I was merely a symbol in the minds of millions of mothers and fathers sweethearts and wives who felt and got the satisfaction out of the fact that I was picked up that their beloved ones also had a chance to be rescued and would come back. Unfortunately, all of them didn't, but it was a great feeling of hope. Back to the living came Captain Eddie Rickenbacker, Colonel Adamson, Pilot William Cherry, co-pilot James Whitaker, Lieutenant John DeAngelis, the navigator, Private John Bartek, and radio operator James Reynolds. Staff Sergeant Alex Kosmachik would never return. In the years since that ordeal, Eddie may have become a quieter man, but he still has all of his cocky assurance, big grin, and unshakable faith 
in the future of the air transport industry in these fledgling years of the jet age. As a flyer, of course, Rick doesn't fly anymore at the controls. He hasn't for some time. But uh, he, those controls, those throttles are still in his hand when he sits in one of those airplanes because he's watching his pilots and and almost gloating sometimes. It's almost gloating in the progress that that pilots have made, that airlines have made, in the safety, for instance, and in the economy and the, the uh, convenience of airline flight. Yes, Captain Eddie is still going strong, and he still flies endless miles along his system, still with the feel of the wild blue sky in his blood. He's a great, throbbing example of the absolute idiocy of retiring a man just because he's 65 arbitrarily. Great heavenly days, this man will be, this Rickenbacker will go on until one day that brave old pump just quits. Captain Eddie Rickenbacker, the Iron Eagle, a man still looking to the future as he answers this question put to him by movie star and fellow airman James Stewart. Captain Eddie, I'm going to ask you a question. We're sort of making this the anniversary question. And we'd appreciate your comments on it. And here's the question. Against the background of Air Force history, what stands out most vividly in your mind, and what do you see as the greatest problem ahead? Jimmy, it's very simple to me. Number one, the accomplishment of the men and women of America in achieving the greatest air force power or air power that the world has ever known in the short span of 50 years, an accomplishment worthy of every man, woman, and child who has played a part in that development. Secondly, the problem of the future is for those of us of the living to impress on those who are to come and to leave behind a heritage and a tradition for them to follow so that they, in turn, may profit by the mistakes that we have made, by the penalties that we have paid, and the generations of the future may live in peace and happiness. Captain Eddie, the Iron Eagle, another in the NBC series, Biographies and Sound. Your guide was Walter O'Keefe. This program was written and produced by Don Cameron, supervised by James L. Holton for NBC News. This is Dick Sinclair. Nowadays, you can hardly pick up a newspaper without reading something about the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, better known as NATO. But did you ever stop to think why NATO is so important, especially to the United States? Sure, we're a powerful nation, but we still depend on the free countries of Western Europe for a great deal. When it comes to exporting trade, for instance, Western Europe is our best customer. And that's where a lot of our vital raw materials come from, too. As far as the world's total manufacturing production is concerned, America accounts for 40% of it. But combined with Western Europe's 30%, the free world controls 70%. And that isn't all. With Western Europe as a partner, we can share mutual advancements in science and invention and our seaports and air bases. Now, those are just a few reasons why NATO is so important to the United States. And most important of all, NATO is guarding your freedom. Biographies and Sound has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.
This is Jimmy Powers coming your way with another Grantland Rice story. Hi there, this is Jimmy Powers, transcribed. Today, from the Granny Rice's best-selling autobiography, The Tumult and the Shouting, we take you back to the period of World War I. It was 1918. Granny was no youngster. He'd been established even then as the most widely read sports columnist in America. But let's see what he had to say about this particular period. I'll pick up his narrative in first person that reads like this. The United States declared war on Germany in April 1917, I was 37 and had been banging away for the Tribune Syndicate for four years. Quite a string of papers were using the Sportlight column, and my pay amounted to $300 a week. In December of that year, I handed over all my securities, totaling about $75,000, to a lawyer for safekeeping. If I didn't come back, at least there remained a tidy chunk for my two girls. Then I enlisted as a private in the infantry. On December the 5th, 1917, a bitter cold day, I pulled out of New York headed for the balmy old south. It was five above and snowing when our train chugged into Greenville, South Carolina. We were marched to Camp Sevier and issued gear, a pup tent and miscellaneous paraphernalia. My tent had a rent in it as big as a frying pan. The next morning when I awoke, I found myself up to my ears in snow and mud. The cold I got that first night in the sunny south lasted until the armistice. The majority of our outfit consisted of southern farm boys. The fact that I was older than most and knew my left foot from my right probably had a lot to do with my becoming a sergeant drill instructor and then a candidate for officer training. During the two months of study in preparation for the written exam required for commission, I was fortunate in getting to know Colonel John Geary. He had a sharp sense of humor, and he understood the enlisted man far better than most officers. Geary helped me to qualify for my commission. In fact, without him, I never would have made it. He had been the athletic officer at the Presidio in California, and after I was pinned a second lieutenant, he put me to work. One morning, he called for me. Lieutenant, he said, I've got two jobs for you. Colonel, I replied, I am already mess officer, telephone sentry, athletic officer, and liaison officer of this outfit. I need more sleep, not more jobs. In this army, replied Geary, it's not how many jobs you have, it's what jobs. Also, that patch of trees over there must be cleared for a baseball field for a game two weeks from today. Colonel Geary's patch was a solid green forest. The next morning, I had 280 men working that forest with picks, axes, saws, and dynamite. The noise of hundreds of stumps being blown to kingdom come was vibrant. In the midst of the flying debris, General Gatley appeared. You've got every man in the regiment, he roared. Who gave you the authority? Colonel Geary, sir, I replied. We played that ball game two weeks later against the 114th. One morning, the entire company was in the field working on a problem involving sighting in cannon for range, deflection, and the rest. My enlisted man and I were in a cluster of turpentine pines. It was hot. Our four-inch howitzer was a sawed-off pine log. The problem was valid to almost everyone but me. Stripped to the waist, my NCO was hard at work 
when Colonel Geary appeared. Son, he asked, do you know what you're doing? Sir, I answered, I haven't the slightest idea. Just as I thought, observed Gatley. Well, I've got something more important for you to do. The morale of this outfit needs a boost. I want you to write me a song, something the men can sing. I never got around to writing that song. Gatley was a Spartan leader. Some of the old-timers in that outfit who had served with him in the Philippines told a yarn that characterized this rugged soldier. Gatley's mountain artillery was scaling a high Philippine mountain ridge, bringing up disassembled guns by mule. The animals were threading their way high up on the mountain pass when one mule, with more curiosity than sense, stopped, stretched his neck over the side, and promptly fell into the ravine 1,000 feet below, gun and all. Charging up, Gatley looked over the side, then roared, It serves you right. One day, walking down the company street, I saw a young recruit sitting in the gutter. One look told me he came from the Tennessee mountains. With his eyes swollen with tears, he was the most homesick pup I ever saw. Looking up at me with a vacant expression, he drawled, Is this France? He had never been more than ten miles from home before. In April 1918, our outfit sailed from Hoboken, New Jersey, aboard the old George Washington. Weeks later, we arrived at Sherburg. I started to the front with my bunch, but didn't get very far before an order came through reassigning me to Paris and the Stars and Stripes. Alec Wolcott, Will Irwin, F.P. Adams, Harold Ross, and others were putting out a daily paper for our soldiers. I shied at the assignment, but it wasn't until four months later that I managed to get orders cut reassigning me to the 115th then up near the Belgian border. After I came home, Kit showed me a letter written to her by Irvin on the day I left Paris for the front. Dear Kit, I saw Granny off to war today. I never saw such a departure for the front. He marched out of here with the biggest backpack I've seen on a mortal, let alone a mule. He was packing enough equipment to quartermaster half the boys at the front. I was pretty loaded down at that. Blankets, fry pan, burner, extra shoes, rifle, that infernal gas mask, socks, shelter half, ammunition. I shed stuff like a molding turkey sheds its feathers until by the time I'd relocated the old 115th, I was wearing one raincoat, period. As a soldier, I was no great shucks. As an officer, I didn't crowd MacArthur. However, I saw and experienced enough of the filth, suffering, and horror of war to realize it never can account for anything that a slice of good Christian faith can't outstrip every time. I saw youngsters hurtling through the skies over France in small fighter planes, and I watched more than a few of them come down in flames. I saw kids and old men slugging through the mud to the front, and the heart inside me twisted as I watched those lines of walking wounded threading their tortured way back again, leaving so many of their buddies dead where they had fallen. I don't think many men come out of a war with their ideals and idols exactly the same. In my case, I found war to be a quick distillation of life's tribulations, all wrapped up in a red, raw bundle. In war, however, the good in a fellow surfaces or sinks much quicker than in civilian life. In many ways, the same applies to sport. Thinking on these things one night, I scratched out the battle line. Wars may be on again, wars may be over so far as the guns are concerned. But life is a fight, not a dream in the clover, no matter what road you have turned. Fate is a party who ducks from the fighter that faces him squarely and grins. But oh, what a wallop he takes at the blighter who trembles when trouble begins. For it's trouble that toughens that fiber all through, the best little trainer the world ever knew. Perhaps we are through with the lung-burning gases on which I am betting no cent. But even if shrapnel or bursting bomb passes, there still is the bill for the rent. There's poverty, bitterness, worry, or sorrow to lead a left hook for the glim. And it may come today or it may come tomorrow, so you might just as well keep in trim. And it's trouble that strengthens the point of the jaw, the best little trainer the world ever saw. When the armistice was finally flashed around the world on November the 11th, 1918... I was at 3rd Corps headquarters on the northwest corner of France near the Belgian border. Everybody from Buck Private to Brigadier immediately got drunk on anything and everything from Cognac to Sterno. 
I wound up at Angers, France, with thousands of troops who suddenly had nothing to do except think and dream about home. We moved down to a port in the south of France, and there we sat on our hunches, waiting and hoping for those heaven-sent orders assigning us to a ship. Our ship finally hove into port. She was the Rindum of the Holland American Line. A flu epidemic broke out less than three days after we pulled anchor. It was a heart-rending sight watching those men and boys dying like flies, knowing they were sinking but struggling that much harder to get home. A thankful, subdued Lieutenant Rice landed at Newport News, Virginia, on a drizzly day in February 1919. I had scarcely thrown down my gear when I learned that the lawyer with whom I had entrusted my securities in 1917 had just committed suicide by swallowing poison. Apparently, he had reinvested the money I left with him and had lost the entire bankroll. Eighteen years after starting, I was back at scratch. I blame myself for that poor fellow's death. I shouldn't have put that much temptation in his way. Kit, Flancy, and I went up to Lake Placid for several weeks. There we succeeded pretty well in getting the misery and stench of war out of our systems for a little while. For dreams have a habit of jerking you back into your past. My days were about to be caught up in the fantastic boom of business and sports, the golden twenties. But for years my dreams were of France and of those who made a crossing much bigger than those of us who had made the long voyage home to the USA. Well, that's it for today. Now this is Jimmy Powers transcribed saying, So long until next time. Pacific and its people, of the peaceful sea and the lands and lives it touches, and their meaning to us and to the generations to come. The Pacific Story, presented by the National Broadcasting Company as a public service and dedicated to a fuller understanding of the vast Pacific Basin. This broadcast series comes to you as another feature of the NBC Inter-American University of the Air, with drama of the past and present, and commentary by Owen Lattimore, authority on the Pacific, and director of the School of International Relations, Johns Hopkins University. in the Pacific. World War I gave Japan its great opportunity. While Britain and France were engaged with Germany in Europe, Japan seized the opportunity to expand its empire. For nearly a month after the assassination at Sarajevo, Tokyo and London debated the terms on which Japan should join the Allies. 
Then, late in August, 1914, Japanese forces have landed 100 miles north of Qingdao in Shandong Province, China, in a move to occupy this German East territory. Although China has declared its neutrality, the Japanese are taking a region far more extensive than the German leasehold. Japanese troops are swinging around to the rear of Qingdao, and Japanese Admiral Kato Tomosaburo is sweeping up mines and maintaining a tight blockade over the fortified harbor of Qingdao. With overpowering might, the Japanese broke through the defenses of the stronghold, and in November, after two months of campaigning, triumphantly paraded into the city of Qingdao. Why the show, you Japanese, the making of this, Admiral Thomas Aburo? It is a great victory for the Allies. I don't know about the Allies, Admiral. We have driven the Germans out of Qingdao and saved you British from coming out here to the Far East to do it. We have to celebrate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It is the first stroke for the Allies in the Pacific. For the Allies? Yes. Japan sent an ultimatum to Germany, you know, to turn over this leasehold in Shandong with view of its eventual restoration to China. And the Germany ignored it. Does the, Japan plan to restore Shandong to China? We are at war now, as you Britishers should know. Germany was negotiating with China to restore Shandong to China. Germany was willing to evacuate Shandong, give it back to China. When Japan attacked, Japan came into the war in compliance with our treaty with you. We have done Britain a great service. Didn't London urge Tokyo not to offer too uh, generous a hand in the Pacific? Japan acted to fulfill her obligations. So Japan came into the war on her own terms. Our Count Okuma clarified our position in his cable to the United States. You mean about Japan having no territorial ambitions? And hoping to stand as protector of peace in the Orient? That is our policy. Uh-huh. Here, you, you see? Look at this. This contingent of your colonials carrying the British colors, marching in with our troops. Uh-huh. That symbolizes the alliance of Japan and the Allies. Yes, Admiral Thomas Aburo. We'll probably remember this triumphal march into Qingdao for a long time. It is an important day. Yes, this day will remind us that Japan came into the war in spite of Britain, rather than because of us. Based in the harbor of Qingdao was a strong German squadron under Vice Admiral von Spee. The Japanese made no effort to watch it during the 10th month of July, 1914, when she, under the Anglo-Japanese Treaty, was on the verge of coming into the war as an ally of Britain. Weeks before the Japanese clamped their blockade on Qingdao, the German squadron slipped out and disappeared into the broad Pacific. The Japanese have permitted speed squadron to slip through their fingers. The Japanese are not interested in German ships. While Spee was escaping, the Japanese were moving in on Qingdao and the German South Sea Islands. You realize what this means? Mm, we had been better off if Japan had not come into the war at all. It means that Spee's squadron is now free to raid our ships all over the Pacific. Vice Admiral von Spee's strong German squadron has been joined by two light cruisers and is now harassing our lines of communication. Spee's squadron has swooped down on another Allied outpost in the Pacific, has cut cables and smashed shore installations. Squadron has captured two more Allied merchantmen. Spee's crack waiting squadron has destroyed the squadron of Admiral Craddock and Coronel off the coast of Chile. There is only one course open to us, gentlemen. We must find and destroy Spee's squadron. We can count on no help from the Japanese, sir. As our allies, they should help in the hunt. So far, they have been indifferent to all our efforts to run down Spee's squadron. Japan is making little more than gestures, sir. Japan has sent some ships. Oh, they might as well have sent windjammers. He's right, sir. They've sent some old hoax from Kamamura's squadron and a captured Russian battleship that was torpedoed at Port Arthur. She's keeping her feet close to home water, sir. If we must do it alone, gentlemen, we must still do it. Spee has detached the Emden, which is now raiding alone throughout the South Atlantic and deep into the Indian Ocean. Between the Emden and the rest of Spee's squadron, the Pacific stands in dread of the Germans. We will detach three battle cruisers from the European war zone and send them to run down Spee. But, sir, we're in sorely need of every ton of... Spee must be destroyed. 
Order the following battle cruisers to proceed at once to the South Pacific. Falklands, eh? Yes, down in the South Atlantic off Argentina. Was there any Japanese battle wagons in on the kill? Not within 10,000 miles there wasn't. What is it these Japs are doing in this blasted war? We asked them to send an expeditionary force to France and they cried it's too far. They ain't got the transportation facilities. They let speed give them the slip and when we asked them to hunt, to hunt with us, why did... Oh, I asked you, what kind of a war is it these Japanese are fighting? <laughs> Japan firmly entrenched herself in Tsingdao, in Shantung province around it, and in the Mariana, the Carolyn, and the Marshall Islands. Then she began to waver in her allegiance to the Allies. Japan seized the opportunity in 1916 to extract from Britain, France, and Italy a promise to support her claims at the peace table to Shandong and the islands. Secret treaties were entered into between all. When the United States entered World War I in 1917, the United States was the only Allied nation that had not agreed to Japanese hegemony in Asia. But the Japanese were soon to create a crisis on this score. <laughs> to consult on joint efforts in the prosecution of World War I, America's allies sent missions to the United States in 1917. From Japan came Viscount Ishii. All interest in Asia, Mr. Secretary, might be called a Japanese Monroe Doctrine. I see. Your worthy predecessor, William Jennings Bryan himself, declared two years ago, in the 1915, that Japan had a special interest in China. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, purpose of your visit, uh, Viscount Ishii, is to discuss our joint efforts in the war, is it not? By all means, Mr. Secretary. Mm. And also, an understanding on problems in which we are mutually interested in the Far East. We wish only to clarify our understanding. Doubtless, Mr. Bryan meant in speaking of your special interest in China that uh, there were particular conditions rising from your nearness to China. Japan is sure that America sees uh, eye to eye with us. Germany is our common enemy. Of course. Of course. Then would it not be best in order to end the rumors of our uh, uh, differences between America and Japan that we show our singleness of policy and interest by exchanging notes? The United States is most eager to do that. Since Mr. Bryan declared that Japan had special interest in China, might it not be helpful both to United States and Japan to clarify our understanding by setting this forth in these uh, notes? Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Bryan's meaning, Viscount Ishii, was perhaps less definite than the words imply. He, uh, he meant it merely as a pleasantry. The United States is a great nation, Mr. Secretary. I have seen your battle fleet in Long Island Sound. I have seen your preparations to maintain an ever-increasing army in France. You are strong because you understand other nations. We have no other nation staked out for seizure, Viscount Ishii. You have nothing to fear, nor has Japan. Thus, you see, we have only to gain mutual confidence by clarifying the understanding between us relative to China. Uh, but uh, there are other points on which we are in complete agreement. We have no disagreement, Mr. Secretary. Japan wishes only to state in our agreements the policy which was set forth by your William Jennings Bryan two years ago. Secretary of State Robert Lansing was unwilling or unable to repudiate the words of his predecessor. And the Lansing Ishii Agreement was signed in 1917. Before the ink was dry and prior to the date the agreement was to be announced, the Japanese informed the Chinese. 
The United States has admitted that Japan has special interests in China. This amounts to an abandonment of the American policy of a friendship for China. China was stunned, and Japan was quick to take advantage of the situation. While the Allies sought the help of the remaining neutral nations against Germany, Japanese agents went to China, and working with Germans there, sought to keep China out of the war. But China won her way into the Allied camp. At the Versailles Peace Conference, at the close of the war... The lansing Ishii Agreement clearly states that the United States recognizes that Japan has special interests in China. This must not be construed, Baron Montino, to mean that the United States accepts the lansing Ishii notes as a commitment to give Japan permanent succession to the German rights in China and in the North Pacific. No. No, 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 no. Japan was in possession of Shandong and the German islands when the lansing Ishii Agreement was signed. A clear confirmation of Japan's rights in these places. Yeah. That Baron Makino is tying this peace conference in a knot. Yeah, for the benefit of Japan. My paper's been buzzing me for a lead on the Shandong question. But with this guy Makino putting on an act that the United States is giving Japan a runaround... Yeah, and... while Japan is actually giving the rest of the nations the runaround. Well, there ought to be a break somewhere along here soon. They can't keep on wrangling over this Shandong question forever. They can as far as China is concerned. That guy, Makino, is not going to break down. Well, I've told my paper they're giving China the works here. Well, I don't know. Yeah, now, you I... watch what I tell you. Wellington Koo set the whole conference on its ear with that plea of his for Shandong as China's sacred province. But for my dough, there's going to be some horse trading here, and China's coming out on the short end. Japan has got her hooks on Shandong and those German islands. And she isn't Japan gone. had Shandong. Her troops were holding it. Her troops were also holding the Carolyn Islands, the Marianas, and the Marshalls. To support her claims at Versailles, she brought out the secret treaties extracted from the Allies before the entrance of the United States into the war. She brought out the Lansing Ishii Agreement, wangled from the United States after its entrance into the war. The big four at the Versailles Peace Conference have surrendered Shandong to Japan. China is indignant and embittered, and the Chinese delegation has been deluged with telegrams not to accept this decision. Uh, what did I tell you? They've sold China down the river. They just let that guy Makino make a monkey out of him on the Shandong question. Well, it's not only Shandong. The League of Nations have mandated the Carolinas, the Marshalls, and the Marianas to Japan. Yeah, I know, but they've only mandated the islands to Japan. They haven't given them to her. Well, Japan's got them, and Japan's going to keep them. And that means Japan now has strongholds south of Manila and east of Guam. And you can figure out that what, what that means to the United States for yourself. <laughs> Two days after the peace conference decided the Shandong question in favor of Japan in April 1919, China flared in protest. On May 3rd, a group of Chinese students at the National University of Peking met to protest the Versailles decision. The Shandong question is a result of corruption and injustice, and we as students must fight to show the world that might should never be right. Yes, right. Yes, right. There can be only one conclusion. A greater world war is coming sooner or later, and this great war will be fought here in the East. Yes, but we cannot fight, wait for the next world war. We must drive Japan out of China now. We must drive out the Chinese traders who have sold our birthright to Japan. Yes, yes, yes. We students with no axes to grind can carry our protest against the award of Shandong to the British and American ministers in the legation quarter. We can march in their bodies. Yes, yes. We will march, all of us, tomorrow. Yes, tomorrow. 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 tomorrow we'll march. Yes, we must expect opposition. Some of us may die. But we can do no less than the student who bumped his head against the stone pillar at Tin Sin to show how easily a student can die for his country. We can do no less than the students who have openly defied the bayonet to the Japanese or the willingness of the orphans to be imprisoned in place of students and to die for them if necessary. Yeah, 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 yeah. I pledge that I will march in protest until death. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, look. Mr. Shia here has deliberately broken his finger and written in blood on the wall, Return our Sing Dao. We need your courage, Shia. 
I shall march in the vanguard tomorrow. We shall all march in a mass parade to the British and American legations tomorrow. We will assemble in groups according to our schools, and we will head for... Next day, May 4th, 10,000 Chinese students march through the streets of Peking carrying flags bearing inscriptions. Self-determination. Hey! International justice. Down with the traitors. We turn our team down. The students fired the imagination of the public, marching mile after mile to the legation quarter to see the allied ministers. The guards have been reinforced, yes. Only a delegation of us wish to enter. Move! If we cannot see the British and American ministers, perhaps we can see Saru Lin. Saru Lin the traitor. Yes, yes, Saru Lin the traitor. We can go to Saru Lin's house. Yes, we can go to Saru Lin's house. Up to Saru Lin's house! On to Chang'an Street, the thousands march to the home of Saru Lin, one of the three pro-Japanese Chinese officials linked with the surrender of Shandong to Japan. Oh, oh, we wish to see Saru Lin. You cannot see Saru Lin. No one is permitted to enter here. They have thrown extra guards and policemen around the soldiers, around the house. Saru Lin to come out. Stand back, stand back. Continue your march. We wish to speak with Saru Lin. Stand back. Oh, Saru Lin has determined not to see us. One of the windows of the house is open. Shall we enter? No. Everyone throw your flags in through the window. Throw them in. Throw the flags in through the window. Let Saru Lin read what is written in our flag. Throw in your flag. Look, the door is open. Somebody has forced the front door open. The door is open. The students are going in after Saru Lin. Yes, let us go in and talk with Mr. Sao. Come on, in after the In after the The students are smashing the windows. They are smashing the windows. Stay close to me. Let's get in there and find Sao. I'm right with you. Let us force our way Come on, the door. Here we go. Saru Lin is not here. But look who we have found. Who is it? Come on, you. Look up. It is Zhang Chungchang, our Chinese minister to Tokyo. Equally guilty with Cao Rulin and the surrender of John Dung. He is pro-Japanese. Yes, another one of the hated pro-Japanese Who officials. Zhang uh, Chungchang, hey, but look. Ah. <laughs> and I have been looking for you too, Mr. Chung. Ah. <laughs> Break up every piece of furniture in the place. other schools joined the movement. Students in other cities joined. Merchants, newspapers, scholars joined. On June 6th, the guards were removed from the doors of the prison, and the 32 students were ordered to go home. But before they would depart, they made four demands upon the government. We demand that the three pro-Japanese traitors identified with the surrender of Shandong be dismissed. Secondly, we demand that students be allowed freedom of speech. Thirdly, that we be allowed to parade through the streets of Peking unmolested, and fourthly, that the government make a public apology to the students. We demand that these... The committees... students had fired the will and the imagination of China. The people of China had taken up the torch. The three traitors were dismissed. The government, of its own accord, sent an apology to the students. The police apologized and sent automobiles to the prison doors. And when the students marched triumphantly out... not being permitted to sign without reservations as to the Shandong question, have refused to sign the peace treaty, unquote. At 
the close of World War I, the seeds of World War II had already been sown. Even at the start of World War I, China had foreseen the catastrophe to come. Before Japan had seized Shandong and the German islands, President Yuan Shikai said, Japan is going to take advantage of this war to get control of China. These are the facts, and here to tell the meaning behind them is Owen Lattimore, authority on the Pacific and director of the School of International Relations, Johns Hopkins University. Mr. Lattimore. What is the biggest difference between the world war of a quarter of a century ago and the war we are fighting now? In my opinion, the difference is in the importance of Asia. In that other war, nobody in Asia was fighting for any particular cause, good or bad. Japan just hung around the edges of the war like a jackal, hungrily snapping up any good bits that came her way. China was hardly in the war at all though Japanese fought Germans on Chinese soil for Chinese plunder, and later a number of nations used Chinese territory as a base for intervention against Russia. It was only at the end of the war that China awoke, stung to protest by some of the more outrageous decisions of the Versailles Peace Conference. This war that we are fighting now is very different. In order to understand it properly, we Americans need to repeat to ourselves constantly a number of statistical facts and to arouse our imaginations to the vast historic sweep of the events in which we are taking a decisive part. How could anybody else's part in the war be more vivid and real than America's part? American blood paid for the beachhead at Salerno, and American courage and skill has carried the attack on inland into Italy. Americans are fighting in the most remote Pacific jungles and in the air over China and Burma. There are American prisoners behind Jap and German barbed wire. The advance on almost every fighting front is marked by its quota of American graves. Yet, with all this, the war is, for us, only a recent war, and it has not cost us a tithe of what it has cost many of our allies. The Dutch have lost every foot of their territory and their possessions. The British have been in the war more than twice as long as we have, and the cost to them in blood, sweat, toil, and tears has been far greater than our sacrifices. The Russians count their casualties in millions, while ours are counted only in thousands. Above all, the Chinese are the veterans of this war, and it is the reasons for which the Chinese fought and the way in which they have fought which have shaped the issues of the war as a whole. Just imagine what terrible problems we should face if this war were, in fact, on top of everything else, a racial war, a war of Asia for the Asiatics, as Japan claims. We owe it to China that the war in the Pacific is not a war of Asia for the Asiatics, but a war in which the issues are the same for Asiatics as they are for Europeans and Americans. Issues of self-defense against aggression, of freedom against subjugation. These are things that have become established clearly in men's minds, partly because the war has been going on longer in Asia than anywhere else. Yesterday, September 18, was the 12th anniversary of the stealthy and treacherous Japanese attack on Mukden. To China, the cost of that attack was the loss of three of her richest provinces, followed by steady encroachment until the whole nation was at war. But the whole world also paid a price for Japan's aggression. Failure to control the aggression undermined the League of Nations and opened the way to the rise of Hitler in Europe. What is the essential difference between the passive, lethargic China of the last war and the dynamic, history-making China of today? How sudden was the transformation? That is just the point, and it is the whole point. The awakening of China is not due to a sudden transformation, and neither is Japanese aggression the result of a sudden transformation. There is a direct line of development from the Japanese generals and admirals who were looking for loot in the last war and the Japanese generals and admirals who were looking for loot when they struck Mukden in 1931, when they struck at Marco Polo Bridge in 1937, and when they struck at Pearl Harbor in 1941. There is also a direct line of development from the passionate students of China who roused their countrymen to protest against the Versailles Treaty in 1919 to the skilled Chinese generals and tenacious Chinese guerrillas of today. In a quarter of a century,
China has changed from the kind of country whose fate is settled for it in distant councils to the kind of country which determines its own fate and in so doing helps to shape the fortunes of other nations and peoples. Twenty-five years ago, China was at the mercy not only of other countries, but of its own corrupt politicians and conscienceless warlords. The pr protest of the Chinese students in 1919 was not only against heartless foreign statesmen, but against traitorous Chinese in high places. In the quarter century since then, the Chinese have no more become a perfect people and a model nation than America has. But they have become less and less a country of civil wars and more and more a country of responsible political standards. They still have great problems to face and to solve. But it is not where they actually stand at the moment that counts. It is the direction in which they are moving. They are moving forward. And because they are moving forward, there is hope that the rest of Asia can also move forward. That in itself is enough to open out the horizons of the world and an assurance against the closed horizons of the Versailles Treaty of a quarter of a century ago. Thank you, Mr. Lattimore. Next week, at this same time, over most of these stations, we will present The Manchurian Incident and its consequences, with drama of the past and present, and commentary by Owen Lattimore, authority on the Pacific, and director of the School of International Relations, Johns Hopkins University. You may secure an illuminating handbook of the Pacific story, with background information on each program in this series, with suggested further reading. This Pacific Story Manual will be sent to you for 25 cents in coin to cover cost of printing and mailing. Address the University of California Press, Berkeley, California. The address again, the University of California Press, Berkeley, California. and directed by Arnold Marquis. The musical score is composed and conducted by Thomas Peluso. Your narrator, Gain Whitman. This program has been presented as a public service and another feature of the Inter-American University of the Air by the National Broadcasting Company and the independent radio stations associated with the NBC network. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Monsignor Fulton J. Sheen of the Catholic University of America will now deliver the 15th in his series of 17 addresses on the general subject, Peace. His discourse today is entitled, Prayer in Wartime. I present Monsignor Sheen. Friends, in this, as in all previous broadcasts, we plead with the Jews and Protestants of the United States to spend an unbroken daily holy hour in prayer and meditation according to the light of their consciences for victory and for peace with justice. And we ask our fellow Catholics in the fullness of their faith in the real presence of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament to make a daily holy hour including Mass and Communion. To aid in this national prayer, we renew our offer to send a Holy Hour booklet free to anyone who asks for it. The basic reason for this appeal is that our enemies have the devil on their side. And unless 
we get on God's side, we will never defeat them. Man is no match for the devil. Unless we pray and are converted to the God of justice and the salvation of Jesus Christ, we must envisage the possibility of defeat. Hence the importance of prayer. In order to understand the meaning of prayer, it may help to make three observations concerning its nature, two of which are negative. Firstly, the essence of prayer is not petition. The important word here is essence, because petition is a legitimate form of prayer. We live in a conditional universe, and many favors are granted on condition that we pray for them. Our Lord himself said, Ask, and you shall receive. There are many favors hanging from the vault of heaven's blue on silken cords, and prayer is the sword that cuts them. What we are here emphasizing is that we must not pray on the constant assumption that the purpose of prayer is to get something. For if we identify getting with goodness, then when we do not get, we may begin to doubt the goodness of God. We must not identify the goodness of God with his readiness to do whatever we ask. St. James tells us, you ask and do not receive, because you ask amiss, that you may spend it upon your passions. Many a man in the United States is living with only one eye or one finger, simply because his parents gave him exactly what he wanted on the 4th of July. I am sure that God has never answered, and will never answer, a bald-headed man's prayer for hair. And a woman could pray from now until the crack of doom, but God will never take the wart off the end of her nose. Think these reflections through and you'll understand why not all prayers are answered. God is omnipotent, yes. He can do all things except one thing. He cannot please everybody. And what a terrible world this would be if God answered the selfish prayers of everyone, we who think we could rule the universe better than God. And furthermore, when we pray, we forget that in prayer God supplies our needs, but not always our wants. Our Lord multiplied the loaves and the fishes and gave to every man all that he needed. Suppose, however, that our Lord, instead of multiplying bread, multiplied gold bricks. How many do you think would have been satisfied with one gold brick? Gold is a want. Bread is a need. God satisfies our needs, not our wants. And our divine Lord said on one occasion, Your father knows what you need before you ask him. The problem is then, do I want what he knows I need? Suppose our dear Lord did come to us as we prayed for something and said, I will give you anything you want. Choose it. Would we not rather abandon our will and counting on his infinite goodness ask him to do the choosing? At Christmas when someone asks what we want, do we not say, you choose, knowing full well that his generosity will be greater than our daring. Why not begin prayer that way, trusting in God because he knows what is best? Secondly, prayer is not an insurance policy or a bomb-proof shelter, a bulletproof vest, or a germicide. This observation for those who think that God should, sus should suspend the operation of his natural laws every time they get in trouble. Did he on Calvary suspend the law that a nail hit on the head by a hammer would pierce a hand or a foot? The very ones who in time of peace 
think the business of God is to ensure prosperity are the very ones who in time of adversity think the business of God is to grant immunity from harm. Some prayers are nothing else but selfish expressions of the self-preservation instinct. Did not our Lord say that the sun shines on the just and the wicked? Therefore, may we not expect bombs to fall on the wicked and the just? If this world were all, if man had no immortal soul, if the scales of justice were not balanced beyond the grave, if the loss of physical life were a greater evil than sin, then the goodness of God could be identified with good health, fat bank deposits, and our freedom from wounds. But since this world is the proving ground of character, it must never be assumed that catastrophe is a special sign of sin. Our divine Lord never spoke of perishing in the physical sense, but in the spiritual. When the Pharisees asked, Rabbi, who has sinned? This man or his parents, that he should be born blind. And our Lord answered, Neither this man sinned, nor his parents. But the works of God were to be made manifest in him. The best lives, therefore, are not always saved in battle. Otherwise, the heroes who die in battle and whose names we inscribe on our war memorials would all be wicked men. A St. Francis of Sissy in a front-line trench would have no guarantee that God would deflect a bullet to protect his life. But this much we could be sure of. No matter what would happen, nothing could ever turn St. Francis away from God. For as St. Paul says, Now we know that for those who love God, all things work together unto good for those who, according to his purpose, are saints through his call. Please do not misunderstand me. It is right and it is just that we should pray for the safety of our loved ones, but we must not think of prayer always in terms of the suspension of a natural law or as a kind of safety device. A chaplain in the last World War said that he heard some men praying as they went over the top. When he wished that they had gone over the top without a prayer, for their prayer was a mark of a broken will, a selfish desire, and a fear of death, a whimpering of formulas for personal protection in time of crisis. And the man alongside of him, who still unbroken and unbeaten, bore his gun like the Savior bore a sore scourge against the thieves, would put that whimpering man to shame. A prayer for personal safety in time of great crises, when moral issues are at stake, is not what a man ought to be thinking about. It entails putting a greater value on physical life than on duty and on justice. The martyrs of old, who were stretched on racks, tortured and burned, were all men of prayer. They prayed for deliverance like their Savior in the garden, but they would not take it at the cost of faith. Or the denial of the Christ whom they bore in their souls. That was too high a price to pay for saving their skins. So they lost their skins and saved their souls. The answer to prayer, then, is not the escape from death, but the power to face it with trust in God. And this brings us to our third point. What prayer really is. Namely, the lifting up of our hearts and our minds to God. More simply still, Prayer is communion with God. 
It is something like you're listening to me on this radio. You wanted to get in touch with me today. You who are listening. We will not go into the question why you did, for it has nothing to do with the analogy. But I can think of one good reason why you all ought to listen to me. Lent, the season of penance. Now a prayer is like tuning in on the radio. It is a means of giving God access to your souls. In order to tune in a radio program, you must set your dial to the proper wavelength. In like manner, in order to tune in to God, you must make your will correspond to His divine will. Once this is done, just as you listen to the radio program to which you are attuned, so now you become obedient to the divine will to which your soul is attuned. Once the wavelength of our will is adjusted to the wavelength of God's will, we get what we want. Then all prayers are answered. The program is just exactly what we want it. Prayer, then, is not asking God to do our will. It is asking God to do His will. The purpose of prayer is not to change God's will, it is rather to change our will. We do not go to God with the blueprint of our desires and then ask God to rubber stamp them. Rather, we ask God to give us His blueprint. And then we mobilize all our energies with His grace to fulfill it. Instead of Him approving our plans, we approve His. In wartime, the proper approach is to ask God to use our collective wills and our national arms for His holy purposes, rather than to ask God to serve our purposes. We do not ask God to fight on our side. We pray to fight on God's side. We pray not as Americans who happen to be Christians. We pray as Christians who happen to be Americans. We ask God to do something for us in order that through us we might work for the betterment of the world and the restoration of the moral order. The essence of prayer, therefore, is the longing at all costs to be caught up in God's purposes. I know of a little child who at Christmas time prayed for a thousand dolls. But she did not receive them. And her unbelieving father, who was constantly ridiculing prayer, one day cynically said to her, Well, God didn't answer your prayers, did he? And to which the child gave the glorious answer. Oh, yes, he did. He said, no. That was the child's way of putting what our Savior expressed in the garden centuries ago. He prayed that the chalice of suffering might pass, if it be possible, he said. It was possible. His father could have done it. Twelve legions of angels, he said, could have routed his foes. But it would have been at the cost of not redeeming man. The divine purpose mattered more than his personal safety. God said no. His prayer was answered. Not my will, but thine be done. And is not that the way we pray every time we say the Our Father? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do we mean it? There's the answer to those who ask such a question as this. The Germans pray to God, the English pray to God, the Italians pray to God, the Americans pray to God. On whose side is God? 
Those who ask that question have not the vaguest idea of the meaning of prayer. They assume that God takes sides on the basis of geography rather than on the basis of goodness. But the answer to the question is that God is on the side of those who do his will. That is why we began a crusade among Jews, Protestants, and our fellow Catholics to pray in our day that God's will will be done amongst us. For if we are with God, no man can be against us. Hence, if the German, the Englishman, the Italian and the American all prayed as they should, they would all be praying for identically the same intention. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There would be perfect unity on both sides of the battlefront. Then we would have peace. Peace on earth to men of goodwill. Prayer then does not so much help our conduct as our conduct tests our prayers. If we think right, we will live right. The greatest stupidity, I think, that was ever uttered was this. It makes no difference what you believe, but only how you act. Nonsense. We act on our beliefs, and if our beliefs are wrong, we'll act wrongly. Prayer comes before conduct. Live with the God of love in prayer, and you'll act lovingly toward your neighbors. Seek with the Christ on his cross, and you'll be charitable to your neighbors. Your actions tell whether you ever pray or not. Not your ears. Prayer is not getting something. It is becoming something. When we become good and glorify his name, then we get not only what we need, but what we ask. And we have his word for it. Amen, amen, I say to you. If you ask the Father anything in my name, in my name, he will give it to you. Pray then that we may be victorious by being on God's side. Begin your prayer with a monologue with God, and it will end with a dialogue between you and the God who redeems you. Not only speak to God, also listen. Do not do all the talking. It is not polite. And let us pray for one reason in this holy hour. To bring ourselves in communion with a purpose, God's purpose, God's will. That is what most of us lack in our lives, a goal, a destiny, a loyalty beyond all fleeting enthusiasms. If we are unhappy, there's one basic reason for it. It is because our purpose is at odds with God's purpose, which is best for us. We are crisscross because we deny the value of the cross. You carry a watch, but you do not make your own time. You take it from the sky. You make your own journeys, but you do not draw your own maps. You take them from the world. You live your own life, but you do not make your own perfection. You take it from God. Therefore, pray. Pray an hour a day. O Lord Jesus Christ, who in thy mercy heareth the prayers of sinners, pour forth we beseech thee all grace and blessing upon our country and its citizens. 
we pray in particular for the President, for our Congress, for all our soldiers, for all who defend us in ships, whether on the seas or in the skies, for all who are suffering the hardships of war. We pray for all who are in peril or in danger. Bring us after the troubles of this life into the haven of peace and reunite us all together forever, O oh dear Lord, in thy glorious heavenly kingdom. The address you have just heard was entitled Prayer in Wartime and was delivered by Monsignor. It is Greer Garson and Basil Rathbone. <laughs> The Gulf Screen Guild Theater. <laughs> Presenting the story, Goodbye, Mr. Chips. And here is your host, the director of the star's own theater, Roger Pryor. Good evening, everyone. Your neighborhood good golf dealer and the Gulf Oil Companies welcome you again to the Gulf Screen Guild Theater. Tonight, it pleases me more than I can tell you to present here one of the most beautiful stories of all time, James Hilton's Goodbye, Mr. Chips, starring Basil Rathbone and that beloved Mrs. Chips, Greer Garson. Speaking for myself, Roger, it pleases me more than I can tell you to be here, and I am delighted that Basil Rathbone is to play Mr. Chips. I think when our story is finished tonight, you will all agree that he has given one of the finest radio performances of this or any year. Thank you, Greer. Ladies and gentlemen, in just a moment, our curtain will rise on the Gulf Screen Guild Theater presentation of Goodbye, Mr. Chips. Meanwhile, Bud Easton wants to remind you of something. All right, Bud. Folks, you've probably been preparing for this fall weather in lots of ways. For instance, getting out your overcoats and sweaters and such things. Well, don't forget to prepare your automobiles, too. Now's the time to change that dirty, worn-out summer oil for a crankcase full of the right seasonal grade of Gulf Lube motor oil. Gulf Lube is the finest motor oil Gulf has ever sold at a regular price. It's refined by the exclusive Multisol process. It resists the formation of sludge, helps prevent hard carbon deposits, and gives you surprisingly long mileage. And folks, when you change to Gulf Lube motor oil, here's something else it will pay you to do at the same time. Protect the wearing points in the chassis and running gear of your car with Gulflex Registered Lubrication, the newest and most scientific lubrication in the market today. Yes, let the Gulf man protect your car in these two ways, with Gulflex Registered Lubrication and Gulf Lube Motor Oil. Right you are, bud. And now Oscar Bradley's music opens our story tonight, and you'll hear Basil Rathbone and Greer Garson in Goodbye, Mr. Chips. <laughs> in the heart of that green island that is forever England, stands Brookfield School, founded 1492. Old walls, old buildings, old oaks, all sleeping in the peace of a September afternoon. And sleeping, too, in the bedroom of a house on a historic quadrangle is an old, old man. There's nothing remarkable about him. He owns no shining medals for valor. He's accumulated no great wealth. He's accomplished no heroic deed that will be recorded in the books of history, and yet, throughout the length and breadth of England, people speak his name. Bad news, Ashley, but I thought you'd want to know. I'll go to Brookfield by the first train. Cancel all my appointments and say I've gone to see Chips. Prime Minister cannot be disturbed, Sir William. Oh, yes, he can. You tell him Chips of Brookfield is dying. He'll listen. Yes, that's what everyone calls him, Old Chips. Or, more formally, Mr. Chipping, beloved Master Emeritus of Brookfield School. The white head turns on the pillow. And Chips smiles in his sleep. Of what is he dreaming? Of textbooks and chapel bells. Of roll calls and scuffling feet. Of names half forgotten, of events long ago. Perhaps dreaming of the desolate figure of an unpopular middle-aged teacher 
as he stands in the schoolyard on the closing day of a school term. Dream on, Mr. Turner, Webb. Wentworth. Wild. Very well. Class is dismissed. Incidentally, I want to be sure that... Isn't it wonderful? No more Latin, no more Greek. I'm going to burn all my books and swim till I go thin. Oh, well. Well, Chipping, well, Chipping, wait. What? Oh, hello, Max. Well, Chipping, look. Just see what I have here. A cake. Where did you get it? A present to the professor from my German class. It's a beauty, no? Yes, indeed, Max. What did you get from your class? I? Oh, uh, nothing. Oh. Well, I'm, I'm glad the summer's here. I will miss the young devils, though. And uh, where do you go for your holiday? Oh, Harrogate, as usual. Harrogate? Yes, I've been going there for 19 summers. Ever since I came here to teach at Brookfield. It's quiet and uh, it's convenient and uh, economical. <laughs> but Harrogate is a resort for romantic old ladies. Oh, oh, oh now, really, Max. <laughs> Look here, why don't you come with me, huh? With you? Yeah, I'm taking a walking trip through the Alps, over the Tyrol, into my country, Austria. Oh, no, 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 it's very kind of you, Max, but uh, really it's quite out of the question, quite impossible. Oh, Mr. Chippin. Yes, Jinks? Uh, the headmaster's compliments, and he'd like to see you in his study right away. Oh, thank you, Jinks. I hope it's good news, sir. Thank you, I... Uh, excuse me, will you, Max? This may be something very important to me. Oh, I can guess what it is. You are going to be promoted to housemaster for next term. I think so. I hope so. Of course you are. Congratulations. And now you must take this trip to with me to the Tyrol. To well, no, 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 no. As a housemaster, that wouldn't be quite well. It wouldn't be quite dignified. And I, I, I you know, I, I, and I must think of that, you know, because, well, I, I, I'd better not keep chat to the street. <laughs> now, don't be nervous. Look him straight in the eye. Oh, I shall. I shall indeed. Uh, goodbye, Max. I'll be there. Ah, a housemaster. Think of that. A housemaster at Brookfield. I want you to understand, Mr. Chipping, this is immensely difficult for me. But frankly, the Board of School Governors feels that any man in the housemaster post should be popular with the boys. That's why, in spite of the fact that you were in line for the position, we decided on Farrington. Yes, I see. This is a very great disappointment, Mr. Chatteris. I, I, I seem to have been a failure here, and I don't quite know why. Now, Mr. Chipping... When I came to Brookfield, I'd never talked before. It was the big chance of my life. Teaching was my great ambition. I was fiercely determined to succeed. But somehow... From the very first day, I missed the trick of getting the boys or anyone else to like me. Instead of a friend, a teacher, I've become, well, just a just a disciplinarian. The board has no complaint to make about your work, Mr. Chipping. We would like you to remain in your present post, if that is agreeable. Yes, oh, yes, yes, of course. It has to be agreeable, doesn't it? Do you know of another school that would accept a teacher who has got nowhere in 19 years? Uh, thank you for your consideration, Mr. Chatteris, and good day. Have a nice holiday, Mr. Chipping. You're going to Harrogate as usual, I suppose. Harrogate? You you do know all about me, don't you, Mr. Chatteris? Ever since the day I came here, you've known what I thought, what I felt, and how I'd turn out. Now, Mr. Chipping... Ah, but this time you're wrong. I'm not going to Harrogate. I'm going abroad on a walking tour. Yes, Mr. Chatteris, I, I feel I need a change, and by this time next week, who knows, I may be climbing the Alps. <laughs> Taking the wrong turn back there with the trails come together. A man my age has no business climbing the Alps all alone. I should have stayed back the inn with Max. Oh dear, oh dear, now I am in a hole. Fog as thick as pea soup. It's getting dark and oh, it's infernally cold. Oh, oh, oh. oh dear. The safest thing to do is to stay here and not move until Max or someone comes after me. Hello? Hello? Extraordinary echo. Hello! Hello! Well, that's very strange. Where are you? Well, in all my experience, good heavens, it's not an echo. I where are you? It's a woman. Hello! Are you in danger? Stay right where you are. Don't be frightened. I'm coming. Hello! 
Hello! Hello! What? Oh, hello. Are you, uh, you all right? Oh, yes, quite, thanks. This fog's rather a nuisance, isn't it? You shouldn't be moving about, you know. It's very foolish of you. Foolish? I heard you call, and I thought you were in some difficulty. What, you mean you climbed up here in this fog to rescue me? Yes, indeed. <laughs> I never heard of such stupidity. Well, I'm probably a much better climber than you are. Then what were you screaming about? I wasn't screaming. I, well, I, uh, I just let out a shout at random, trying the echo, you know. Oh, really, it was idiotic of you to take such a risk. And, and rather wonderful. Oh, oh, not at all. Well, anyhow, I'm awfully glad you came. It, it was going to be very lonely. Won't you sit down? This rock is quite comfortable, <laughs> as rocks go. Oh, yes. My, uh, my name is, uh, is Chipping. Mine's Ellis. Catherine Ellis. Have a sandwich? Oh, have you... Uh, oh, yes, loads of them, yes. Well, thank you. I, I am hungry. That one's um, ham. Yes. Uh, uh, pardon. It's very good, too. I'm sorry I wasn't in any danger. It was rather inconsiderate of you. What are you doing alone on a mountain? My friend didn't feel like climbing, so I left her down at the inn. We're bicycling. Bicycling? Yes. Do have another sandwich. Uh, thank you. Good heavens, I... I didn't know that ladies wrote those awful things. I'm afraid they do, Mr. Chipping. With one leg... Uh, I, I beg your pardon. I mean, uh, one limb on either side of a saddle. Now, how could anyone ride a bicycle side saddle? But, uh, but what happens to your to your dress? Oh, they, uh, they breed female bicycles now. Didn't you know? Really? Ladies riding bicycles. It's quite daring, isn't it? No, not at all. Well, uh, being a schoolmaster, I may be a bit old-fashioned. You see... I've never been what they called a, a, a ladies' man. Afraid of them? Terrified. Oh, not of me, I hope. No. So it, it, it's very strange, but I'm not. Perhaps it's the altitude. Uh, tell me, uh, do you experience a sort of a, oh, a sort of exhilaration? Definitely. As though we own the mountain. Every stone of it. We're a pretty superior person. We are gods. Yes. Yes, it must be the altitude. Uh, yes, yes, we'd better start getting off this mountain at once. What, in all this fog? Well, we've got to get back to the inn. It'll soon be night. Well, what are you saying? Why, we both missed the part and be killed. Oh, I'm saying here. But it's damp. It's cold. Yes, isn't it? I'm freezing. Oh, dear me, dear me, how rude of me. Uh, here, uh, do take my coat. What, and leave you unprotected? Of course not. Oh, I'm warm enough. Really, I am. No, no, I have a much better idea. It's a big coat and, and we'll share it. Oh, like I... this. See, <laughs> now, really. There, see? Well, oh, there's nothing wrong with this, is there? Cozy, isn't it? But good heavens, Miss Ellis. Suppose someone were to see you. What would they think? What could they think? Now, who's going to see us away up here on a mountain? May as well face it, Mr. Chipping. We're here for the night. Oh, oh! I'm sure someone will discover us before morning. They've got to rescue us before morning. And what if they don't, Mr. Chipping? Well, 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 in, in that case, Miss Ellis, as you said, I suppose we'll just have to face it. What are you doing out of the balcony, Catherine? I'm looking up at my mountain, Flora, in the moonlight. I should think after last night you'd have seen enough of it. It's going to be rather a thrilling memory when our vacation is over. It is a pity your knight errand was such an old stick in the mud. He's not old, Flora, and I think he's... He's quite charming. Why, Catherine. Oh, that doesn't mean I'm in love with him, of course. Well, that's fortunate. Because his friend just told me they were leaving for Vienna tomorrow. Oh. Oh, he did? I wonder why your Mr. Chipping didn't look in to say goodbye. Oh, he's... He's terribly shy. I'm always so sorry for shy people. Aren't you must be so lonely sometimes. Flora? Yes? How far is it to Vienna by bicycle? Isn't it the most amazing coincidence our meeting in Vienna, Mr. Chiffy? You know, you were the very last person on earth I expected to see. Believe me, it's the most wonderful thing that ever happened to me, Miss Ellis. Oh, uh, oh, waiter. Yes, sir. Uh, some wine, please. 
Oh, no, 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 no. Look, bring a champagne. Yes, sir. Perhaps Paul Roger, 1865. Oh, dear me, no. Nothing as old as that. We want something fresh. The very best. Uh, fresh. Uh, yeah. I feel like a little girl at her first party. So do I. Uh, well, that is, I mean, of course, I feel like a small boy. <laughs> Perhaps we feel young because this room is so old. Did you know that the Treaty of the Five Kingdoms was drawn up here nearly a hundred years ago? I shall always think of it as the place where I dined with, well, with you. Thank you. And I shall never forget they were playing the Blue Danube Waltz. Wouldn't you like to remember that you danced to it? Dance? I? Of course. Oh, no, 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 I, I couldn't possibly. Why not? Well, I haven't danced for years. Then it's high time you started again. Oh, no, not not, not before all those people. Well, of course, if you really don't want to. Oh, it's not that. It's, uh, I, I do want to. It would have been fun to remember. Yes, yes, it would. But, uh, Miss Ellis. Yes, Mr. Chitty. Uh, may I have the pleasure of this dance? Oh, Chip, you darling. <laughs> You see, you haven't forgotten why you done beautifully. Thank you. Now, reverse. Reverse? Oh, I, I don't believe I That's could. That's it. You see how easily it's done? Yes, by heavens, I did make it, didn't I? I haven't had such fun in years. Neither have I. The pity it has to end so soon. So soon? Yes. <laughs> I have to start for home tomorrow. Oh, but look here, you can't, you... Reverse? Hey, what? Oh, yes. I shall have so much to remember when I get home. Oh, so shall I. Marvelous memory. Uh, Miss Ellis, uh, Kathy, uh, there's something I'd like to ask you. Yes, Mr. Chipman. Of course, it's uh, it's very presumptuous of me. I I couldn't possibly expect a favorable answer. Why? What is it? Well, well, it's it's this. I I haven't much to offer, but uh, would you consider? Yes, Mr. Chipman. Uh, could you? That is, uh, would you? Would you consider trying that dance step again? Reverse, Miss Kathy. And the thanks I can give the compound that took the house food and took the man red there. The train, train's about ready to start, Kathy. What time do you get to London? Oh, dear me, yes, of course, I asked that before, didn't I? Yes. Oh, isn't saying goodbye awful? Yes. Yes, isn't it? I mean, it's so, it's so, uh... Yes, yes, that's exactly what it is. There, there, the train's starting to move. Jump on, Kathy. Oh, dear, yes. Goodbye, Mr. Chip. And when you're remembering, please remember me with this. Goodbye. Goodbye. Miss Ellis! Kathy, wait! Kathy! Kathy, do you hear me? Yes, but don't fall under the train. You just kissed me, you know. I know, what a dreadful Well, look here. You'll have to marry me now. Oh, do you love me? Oh, frightfully, do you? Yes. This is a dirty trick on your part, Max, getting <laughs> us here to meet the newlywed. Yes, any girl who'd marry Chipping must be a fright. Chipping's bad enough, but now we'll have to put up with a Mrs. Chipping, too. Come up and stay out. Put that tea away, Max. Yes, let's shorten your deal as much as possible. And Max, for heaven's sake, don't ask them to sit and stay. Ah. Come in, Chipping. Oh, hello, everyone. Hello, Kathy. Uh, you can only stay a moment, Max. Um, come in, Kathy. Thank you. Uh... These are my colleagues, my dear. How do you do? Oh, it's so nice to meet you all. And just a little terrifying. <laughs> Chip told me how distinguished you all are. Chip? Oh, Kathy, really. Uh, just a nickname she's given me, fellows. I would. Chips. Why didn't we think of that? Oh, please sit down, Mrs. Yes, yes, please. Yes. Yes. Chip. Yes, yes. Sit here, Chip, old man. It's good to see you again. Oh, Max, for heaven's sake, where are your manners? Aren't you going to give the chipping some tea? <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Chipping. It was a jolly party, Mrs. Chipping. The scales were wonderful. Goodbye, Mr. Chip. I mean, Mrs. Chipping. Goodbye, boys. I haven't enjoyed a party so much for ages. Goodbye, boys. Hurry now to assembly or you'll be late. Bye, Bye. Uh, What a nice lot of boys they are. Yes, yes. 
Your idea of giving a party for them was a good one. But, uh, my dear, what authority will I have in my classes after such an affair? Ten times more, Chip, because they'll know you as a friend. Know me as a friend? Oh, Kathy, how I wish they would. They will. You wait and see, Chip. Oh, the most glorious news. Wilkinson is leaving, and I've been advanced to housemaster. Well, Mrs. Chipping, prepare yourself. Beginning next term, my salary goes up 20 pounds. So where shall we spend this summer? What oh, that's wonderful news, Chip. Thanks, old man. I wanted you to be the first to know. Of course, I hope it will be a boy. So do we, both Kathy and I would like him to go to Brit Brookfield, you know. Kathy, darling. I'm so sorry. So sorry the way things turned out. That doesn't matter, darling. The doctor said that it, it would have been a boy. You're all I care about. Chip. You mustn't talk. I'm, I'm... I'm going away. Aren't I? No, no. Of course not, Kathy. I couldn't live without you. Oh, Chip. I've been so happy. No one's ever been so happy. Ever. Darling. Dearest. Will you make me a promise? Yes. Yes, Kathy. You'll carry on. Even if I'm not here. Won't you? Kathy, I... The boys, Chip. The boys of Brookfield. They're the only children in this. I can't do it. I can't do it, Kathy. Please. I promise. All right. I promise. Say it. No matter what happens, I shall carry on at Brookfield for always. No matter... No matter what happens, I shall carry on at Brookfield... For always. Now, now, now tell me. I want to see if you remember how we met, what we did, and how, how we fell in love. Well, well, uh, once upon a time, there was a very lonely teacher, and he went, he went, he went to Switzerland. There he met a beautiful girl on a mountain top. In Vienna they danced all night and fell in love. And the... Kathy. Kathy, do you hear me? Kathy. Oh, Kathy. Kathy, Kathy. <laughs> Come to order. Did you hear? This is Chips is dead. Turn to uh, to page twenty-nine. Had a tea last week. Yes. The uh, first paragraph at the top of the page. I don't know what Chips will do without her. Collie, yes. will you begin the translation? Yes, sir. In every age, the barbarians have oppressed. Have oppressed. Go on, Collie. Yes, sir. Have oppressed. Oh, I can't. I can't. Holly, Holly, please. I know how you feel, but we must go on. That's what she wanted. For all of us to carry on at Brookfield for always. Now, now, come, Collie. Read with me. In every age, the barbarians have oppressed... 
the peaceful nations all, all over, over the world, world who neglect and... and Chips went on through the years as he had promised. He saw three generations come and go. He became headmaster of Brookfield and was the most honored, most loved man the great school had ever known. Then, in his 85th year, he retired. And now, mourned by all of England, old Chips is dying. A doctor and the present headmaster of Brookfield are in his room. Chips' eyes open slowly as their voices come to his ears. A remarkable character, Marshal. A great character, Doctor. I knew him and I knew his wife. She died many years ago, I understand. Yes. That's her picture there on the table by his bed. Ah, lovely head. Pity he never had any children. Yes. What? What? what was that you said about me? Nothing, Chips. We, we were just talking and waiting for you to come out of that beauty sleep of yours. Oh, no. no, I heard you. You said it was a pity. I had no children. But I have, you know. I have thousands of them, and all boys. Chips. Chips. He doesn't seem to hear you. Is it the end, Doctor? I'm afraid so. Carried on, my dear. I've carried on, Kathy. Oh, it's been such a long time without you, Kathy. Such a long, long time. The job's finished, Kathy. It's done. Gulf Curtain falls on the conclusion of Goodbye, Mr. Chips, which was written for radio by Charles Taswell and Hector Chevney. Greer Garson and Basil Rathbone will be with us again as soon as we give them a few seconds to sort of catch their breath. And during those few seconds, we have something of interest to everyone who's ever sat behind the wheel of an automobile. You know, friends, a doctor can tell a lot about a patient's condition just by having him take a little exercise, then getting out a stethoscope and listening. Well, in much the same way, you can tell a lot about your car just by accelerating suddenly or driving up a steep hill and listening to the engine. For if you hear a knocking, pinging sound, that's a sign your car is wasting gas and wasting power. And it may also mean some expensive repair bills. So better fill up with Gulf No Knox gasoline. This extra-value gasoline has been raised to an extremely high anti-knock rating. It's especially designed to stop that harmful hammering and pounding in your motor. As a result... Gulf No Knox gives you a quieter, smoother-running motor at maximum mileage. So the very next time you need gasoline, get a gasoline designed to make your car run quieter and run better. Gulf No Knox Gasoline. Basil, I want to tell you that your performance was all that Greer said it was going to be. Thank you. And as for you, Greer... Your interpretation of Mrs. Chips, both on the screen and on our program tonight, will always constitute one of the really fine performances of our time. Thank you, Roger. That's sweet of you. 
Uh, what's your dramatic treat for next week, Roger? We're going to do that delightful comedy melodrama hit of stage and screen, The Amazing Dr. Clitterhouse. Oh, that's wonderful. I hope you'll have Eddie Robinson starring in it. You can bet on that, Greer. We'll not only have Edward G. Robinson playing Dr. Clitterhouse, the scientist who became a crook, but in addition, we'll also have Humphrey Bogart and Marsha Hunt. So be with us next week, won't you, friends? Until then, this is Roger Pryor speaking for your neighborhood good golf dealer and saying, Good night, everyone. Now, a special announcement. If you would like to have a beautiful full color portrait ready for framing of Loretta Young, be sure to get the new issue of Photoplay Movie Mirror Magazine, now available at all newsstands. But Easton speaking, this is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> <laughs>